fires, tornadoes, volcanoes, tidal waves, meteorites. When these kinds of natural phenomena occur, they can be cataclysmic major events, bringing with them staggering loss of human life, tragic environmental devastation, destruction and hardship. In this sobering yet thrilling installment of Desperate Hours, our special focus is on geological disasters. Now, most natural disasters, including volcanoes and earthquakes, are, of course, geological disasters. But avalanches, landslides, blizzards and heat waves, they don't usually cause fatalities in the tens of thousands, do they? Don't be lulled into a false sense of security. While casualty counts might be lower, geological disturbances like landslides and heat waves can cause their fair share of misery. Let's begin with avalanches, the rapid flow of snow down a mountain or hillside. Afghanistan. In some parts of the country, temperatures can soar to 49 degrees Celsius during the summertime. But in the mountains, the snow falls thick and fast. There were three chains of avalanches that could be quickly categorized as geological disasters in the first half of this decade, in 2010, 2012, and 2015. The most recent avalanches in 2015 in Afghanistan's Panjshir Valley were virtually in a category of their own. Avalanches some 40 meters high totally submerged homes and entire villages. The hardy mountain people that live in this region had not seen anything as bad in 30 years. Over 280 people were killed, with many more injured and traumatized. As always with avalanches, but particularly in the Panjshir Valley, rescue and aid teams had to reach places not easily accessed at the best of times. <laughs> It had been the same, if not worse, a few years before, when an avalanche in the northeastern Afghan highlands demolished a village, home to some 200 people. Most of the village was simply caked in snow. The nearest hospital was across a national border in neighboring Tajikistan. This is a place where most travel is either on foot or horseback. Though, of course, there are some four-wheeled vehicles but nowhere was safe when snow fell in a massive dump from just 40 meters above. Nearby villagers offered what help they could, but outside help only came days after the avalanche, when people from Dawaz district and 25 aid workers from Tajikistan arrived on the scene. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. In Pakistan, on the 7th of April 2012, an avalanche struck at a military base in the territory around the Siachen Glacier. 140 soldiers and civilian contractors were trapped under deep snow. 
Hopes were high they'd eventually be saved. जो अभी टीम्स आई हैं स्विस और जर्मन जो कल पहुंची हैं, उन्होंने भी जा के उसको बाय एंड लार्ज ऑथेंटिकेट किया है कि जिस जगह पे आप डिगिंग कर रहे हैं, बाय एंड लार्ज इट इस करेक्ट। Only on May 29th did authorities officially declare the 129 soldiers and 11 civilian personnel were dead. Nepal is renowned for its mountains, especially Mount Everest, the largest mountain in the world. On Saturday, the 25th of April, 2015, an earthquake in Nepal set off an avalanche on Everest, killing dozens. It was all too soon after the tragic events of April 2014, when an avalanche on Everest killed 16 Nepalese guides. Our three members uh, did not uh, come back to that uh, village. Next day we were uh, said that uh, some of our uh, people are uh, missing and uh, the search was on. As a mark of respect for the victims, the Sherpa guides announced later that April they would not work on Everest for the remainder of 2014, and they stayed true to their word. Where were you in 62? With any luck, nowhere near Mount Huascaram in northern Peru. Because that's when a tidal wave of snow, ice and boulders swept down from Peru's highest mountain onto the village below, killing around 3,000 people and displacing thousands more in the region. A few years later, in one of the worst years on record for avalanches, the French ski resort town of Val d'Isère was pounded by a huge wave of snow that killed 42 people in its wake. Unfortunately, avalanches have little respect for human life. Neither does the landslide, another geological phenomenon, one that includes quite a broad spectrum of underground movements, such as rockfalls, the collapse of hillsides and slopes, and shallow debris flows. These can all be considered landslides. They can happen offshore, in coastal and onshore environments. While the scale of destruction from a landslide may sound less dramatic than an avalanche, landslides can also be devastating, not just to the environment, but also to the human spirit, leaving a trail of heartbreak and horror. Bali, nangyayarapan kami dahil sa ano, yung katawan, almost nagdecompose na yung katawan. So, pag-lift namin, yung ano, mababali na yung ano, minsan yung paa, nabali na pag ano namin. <laughs> Who needs an avalanche? It's staggering when you consider the damage caused by landslides alone. Leyte Island in the central Philippines was devastated by a landslide that destroyed an entire village of 2,000 people. The people living around the island's tropical mountain terrain had suspected a landslide or avalanche was imminent. For weeks, they had evacuated their village. But when the heavy rain from a typhoon finally subsided, they returned to their homes. Only days later, tragedy struck. 
hundreds buried alive by the slide. The impact was devastating. Huge difficulties were encountered by rescue teams trying to identify where people were buried and in keeping themselves safe, let alone finding survivors. <laughs> On July 30th, 2014, in an Indian village called Malin in the Maharashtra province, around 100 people were killed by a landslide. But was Marlin another tragedy that could have been avoided with a little more preparation? Could it have been caused as a result of human action like farming or road construction? And more than one reporter noted that the village of Marlin is only a kilometer or two away from the backwaters of Dimby Dam, an irrigation project finished in the year 2000. Measured a few days earlier, it had held 250 plus million cubic meters of water. That's a big enough volume of water to make anyone in the neighborhood very uneasy. A year later in Northwest Colombia, it wasn't the folly of man responsible for landslides, but the sheer volume of rain. It was that which was responsible for landslides that killed more than 80 people, with mud rushing into houses and smashing bridges. La quebrada arrasó con mi hermana, mis sobrinos, y no los hemos podido encontrar. Esta es la hora en que solamente encontraron uno y ellos son cuatro. The random cruelty and wanton destructiveness found in nature is truly overwhelming. But geological conditions don't even have to be as obviously destructive as avalanches and landslides to create havoc and heartache. A heat wave can be one of nature's silent killers. India is justifiably renowned for its hot climate, but the heat wave that scorched India in the middle of the decade was something else. The May 2015 heat wave was said to be responsible for 2,500 deaths, making it the second deadliest heat wave in India on record. For two miserable weeks, temperatures soared to nearly 45 degrees. In New Delhi, the 45 degree heat actually started melting roads. Day upon day, night after night, of searing temperatures hit the homeless, the elderly, and those who work outside the hardest. Okay. With the temperature reaching uh, to 47, 48 degrees Celsius to you know, some areas. Now the people have been advised uh, through various mediums of communication to take adequate precautions in this regard. Uh, mainly, you know, not to venture out uh, into the open uh, during the hot sun. But even at night time, the heat was stifling. When the monsoon season finally began, a little later than usual, it brought cool and refreshing rains and a welcome drop in temperature. These climatic effects are being felt in the United States as well, from North Dakota to Massachusetts, Washington DC to Chicago, America had a scorcher of a summer in 2013. Temperatures in most U.S. states rose above 32 degrees Celsius, and the humidity certainly didn't help matters. 
Some people, especially those on vacation, managed to find ways to make the most of the sizzling hot temperatures. But it was no day in the park for practically anyone who had to work outside all day. 105 degrees, stifling heat, sun barreling down on you. But you gotta make your money. The emergency department we've had, you know, uh, definitely an increase in the number of patients presenting with, you know, heat exhaustion type symptoms, heat cramps, um, you know, just dehydration, being outside for a little too long, being a little too, too active outside. But we've also had a, a few patients who've come in with heat stroke, so the most severe form of heat illness. Of course, there are times when a heat wave is not quite so severe. People in Britain can look back with nostalgia to the lazy, hazy summer days of 1957, when the whole country experienced unusually high temperatures up to 36 degrees Celsius throughout the entire month of June. Ah, the good old days in the UK, when a swimming costume just meant rolling your trousers up and sunblock meant tying a handkerchief around your head. Even heat waves had better manners in those days, it seems. But geological disasters and disruptions come in all shapes and sizes. Sinkholes must be one of the most curious geological phenomena mankind has ever encountered. A few years ago, in a remote village in Bosnia, the inhabitants were astounded when their local pond disappeared. These mainly occur in what's called karst terrain, soluble bedrock like limestone or gypsum which can be dissolved by water. Any hole in the ground which is created by erosion from a few feet across to the size of a football field can be considered a sinkhole. Most of them form slowly over time. Others, like the one in Bosnia, can appear suddenly. Some of the villagers, however, insisted on more colorful explanations. In human cost, sinkholes aren't as bad as they look, responsible for just a few isolated fatalities. Blizzards, however, a different animal altogether. A blizzard is a severe snowstorm with winds in excess of 56 kilometers per hour and almost no visibility for more than three hours. Blizzards can also occur after snowfall when high winds cause whiteouts, fallen snow blowing around, and snow drifts, huge mountains of snow, which decrease visibility. In the US, they've started calling these winter storms Snowmageddon. But winter whiteouts like the January 2015 Northeast American blizzard are no laughing matter. Juno, the unofficially named winter storm, was one almighty nor'easter that affected Canada and the central and eastern United States, and eventually parts of Greenland and Western Europe. On January 26, 
Millions of people along the east coast began preparing for heavy snow, powerful winds, and coastal flooding. With a blizzard warning issued for a 400-kilometer stretch of the northeast, including New York City and Boston, people were expecting the worst, and in many cases, they got it. There were, however, notable exceptions. When Juno finally hit, it wasn't quite with the ferocity expected. Now that said, 83 centimeters of snow fell in parts of northeastern Connecticut, Providence, Rhode Island got 43 centimeters of snow, and Portland, Maine was covered in over a meter of the white stuff. Power, the Boston area was buried in more than 60 centimeters of snow. Um, I'm guessing there's probably 10 to 12 inches right now on the ground. And it's still coming down about two inches an hour, I'd say. Yeah, we thought we were getting it off easy this winter because we haven't had much snow. And all of a sudden, we got the big blizzard and then this. And it sounds like there's some more to come. And yet New York, which had been bracing itself for the worse, was somehow spared. American meteorologists apologized for their big miss after the Big Apple was largely spared by Juno, with a not unusual January overnight snowfall of around 15 centimeters. With cars banned from the roads and public transport shut down, the city that never sleeps looked like a ghost town. But it's surely better to be safe than sorry. That same year, the holy city of Jerusalem was covered by a resplendent white blanket after the worst snowstorm there in decades. With up to eight inches of snow piling up in the city and temperatures below freezing, schools and highways were closed. A storm like that, I don't remember for a long time, and I'm living in Jerusalem for 38 years, about, for 38 years, and didn't see such a snow. It was actually the most snow the city had seen since 1879. Jerusalem was brought to a standstill, and at the height of the storm, power cuts left 60,000 homes without electric heating. For the old people, it's worse. Like, for us, it's really fun because we don't get snow, but for old people, it's, I think it's really hard, especially with all the um, electricity network collapsing and a lot of people got jammed in cars. So, luckily, no one died. Perhaps few people would choose to rhapsodize about the British climate, but actually, most of the time, it's quite mild and temperate. But in 1978, the southern and western parts of the United Kingdom were battered by blizzards and congested by snowdrifts. Many people were trapped in their homes for days. In Yeovilton in the West Country, the military were called upon to fight with General Winter. Rescue operations were mounted by all three branches of the armed services, mainly consisting of dropping off food and supplies and airlifting the seriously injured to hospitals. So there you have it, our dangerous world, where geological mishaps, avalanches, landslides, Heat waves, sinkholes, and blizzards can spell disaster almost as much as the big cataclysms, such as earthquakes, volcanoes, and tidal waves. It's enough to make you want to purchase that one-way ticket to Mars.
Floods, fires, tornadoes, volcanoes, tidal waves, meteorites. When these kinds of natural phenomena occur, they can be cataclysmic, major events bringing with them staggering loss of human life, tragic environmental devastation, destruction, and hardship. It's part of being human to be aware of the dangers that are around us all the time. But there's a big difference between doing that and ignoring inconvenient facts or making things worse. After all, life on planet Earth is a fragile enough proposition as it is. So in this rather sobering installment of Desperate Hours, our special focus is on environmental disasters. There are a lot of natural disasters, including volcanoes and earthquakes, that we can't do a great deal about. But there are environmental disasters and disasters in the making that would make sense to prevent, if and while we still can. Let's take the long view for a moment, the view from outer space. It seems we, as a species, are poised on the brink of incredible scientific breakthroughs. This has coincided with climate change, some of it undeniably man-made. The Earth seems to be heading for some kind of tipping point. There have been efforts to turn the ship around. You can go back, for instance, to the Kyoto Protocol, an international agreement to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases responsible for global warming. In 1997, when the Kyoto Protocol was signed in Japan, the dramatic effects of climate change were already becoming visible in places. The Marshall Islands, for example, Already just an average of three meters above sea level, islanders were reporting unusually high tides and sea surges. The, the habitable portions of the Marshall Islands and many other island nations could be totally eliminated. Uh, sea level rise actually has the potential to completely wipe out certain societies. Rising sea levels as a result of the polar ice caps melting are one of the troublesome consequences of climate change. And that year, in Kyoto, delegates spoke of their fears. The resulting agreement to mandate country-by-country -country reductions in greenhouse gas emissions was ratified by 150 countries with a notable exception of the US. Developing countries, including China and India, weren't mandated to reduce their emissions. And the protocol didn't even come into effect in some signatory countries for several years. During which time, worldwide greenhouse gas emissions soared by close to 40%. More than enough greenhouse gas to offset any reductions made by the Kyoto countries since 1997. For all its limitations and failures, the Kyoto Protocol was arguably a step in the right direction. Any start is a good start if it is followed through. Just look at the pollution all around us, especially in urban areas, the sheer waste that is part of 21st century life. So before we even get into topics like Amazon deforestation or the South Pacific garbage patch, let's take a hard-eyed look into our own backyards. When trash is left in a landfill, greenhouse gases are released into the air and heavy metals seep into the soil. 
It's one of the worst things we can do to the environment. It is hardly surprising to learn that in the so-called developing countries, or regions where the infrastructure has been weakened by war and crises, that clean and efficient waste disposal has not been that high on the list of priorities. These scenes of squalor and chaos are from the streets of Beirut in Lebanon. In 2015, mountains of waste like these had become a common sight on Beirut streets. It happened after the city's main landfill was closed and the city's management system was in a state of chaos. يجب ايضا اعاده تاهيل المكبات العشوائيه المنتشره في مختلف المناطق اللبنانيه والتي يفوق عددها 760 ومع الاسف برمي النفايات في كل مكان في الاسابيع الماضيه ربما ارتفع هذا العدد الى ما يزيد عن But we shouldn't sneer because waste recycling in first world countries often leaves a lot to be desired as well. There are some places, however, where they're trying to make an effort. These days, Sweden is one of few countries which not only incinerate and recycle their own waste, but they actually import household refuse from around Europe and dispose of that too. In 2011, they incinerated around 800,000 tons of trash in Sweden, most of it imported. Only a tiny percent of the country's own garbage is now left in landfills. This has been made possible because of waste to energy incinerator plants. Det är flera steg av rening vilket gör att vi fångar i stort sett alla tungmetallerna och immobiliserar dem. Vi tar bort dem från miljön och ser till att de aldrig kommer ut i miljön. Critics of the Swedish recycling effort say the process is not without its dangers, however and is even, at best, only a localized, short-term solution to a larger global problem. Countries ideally should clean up their own backyards. When it comes to polluting the oceans, where do we begin? The Great Pacific Garbage Patch also known as the Pacific Trash Vortex. It's a vast gyre of plastic garbage floating in the seas of the North Pacific Ocean. Because it is comprised of untold amounts of debris floating just under the water's surface, its size is hard to estimate. But it's said to cover as much space on a map as the state of Texas. The very existence of the Pacific Trash Vortex is a shameful, hideous blot on the face of our planet. Of course, it did not accumulate overnight, but until recently, nobody seemed to be putting forward any solutions to tidy it up. Then, in 2014, the youngest ever winner of the United Nations' top global environmental prize put forward a plan to rid the ocean of its vast flotillas of plastic garbage. That young scientist was 22-year-old Dutch entrepreneur Boyan Slat, and his plan is to use natural ocean currents and winds to send the plastic along floating barriers into a central recycling point. We will never be able to clean up every last kilo of plastic, but we're really focusing on the areas where the plastic is most concentrated. And what we've now been able to show that with a single system in 10 years time, almost half the Great Pacific Garbage Patch uh, can be cleaned up. The first cleanup device is expected to be deployed in Japanese waters by 2016. The worst after effects of an environmental catastrophe have all but vanished a decade later. Take the BP oil spill of 2010. The world was aghast at those images of birds and other wildlife completely coated in oil. Yeah. Oh, 
where she's oiled up. It's, it's a young bird. You can feel the oil. You can feel the oil all over. An estimated 3.19 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf over three months in 2010. But just five years after the BP oil spill, things for the most part seem to have returned to normal along the Gulf of Mexico. You see that the mangroves here are, are fairly healthy. You didn't see a lot of dead standing mangrove, not a lot of brown, gray. The worst might have been over after a decade, but oil spills are obviously not good for the environment and still happen far too often. This oil spill happened in May 2015 off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. It was estimated that around 500 barrels of oil were pumped into the ocean. Quite minimal when you think of the BP oil spill. But as marine biologists observed, this was enough to kill hundreds of animals, with a more precise figure hard to calculate, as of course the animals affected dispersed to other parts of the ocean. As well as all the other human activity that impacts the environment, these kinds of accidents just ratchet up the toll on our fragile planet. Last, but definitely not least, for the different forms of pollution there are, is of course, air pollution. These days, if you live in any reasonable sized city, it is something you can hardly fail to notice. But of course, it is in the developing world where cities can rise up seemingly overnight, where pollution is usually at its worst. The Chinese city of Beijing held the top spot as the world's most polluted capital city. That was until recently when the Indian capital of Delhi took over. This of course is a dubious distinction to hold. But the problems of smog and exhaust fumes are hardly limited to China or India. In recent years, Paris, the so-called city of light, has looked a lot more foggy than it really should. Un refroidissement nocturne, le sol est très froid, l'atmosphère est chaude. On bloque par un système de couvercle l'ensemble de la de la pollution est piégé au niveau du sol et du coup les concentrations augmentent. To combat the fumes, the city has more than once clamped down on driving and parking permits. They also made public transport temporarily free in central Paris. A nice gesture and a sensible move in terms of city management, but a drop in the ocean in terms of the environment, of course. And not all Parisians were impressed or even that bothered. Trouve ça un peu dérisoire. Comme c'est fait ponctuellement, maintenant c'est vrai que je m'intéresse pas trop à ce phénomène, mais je trouve que c'est un peu dérisoire. Carbon monoxide poisoning can of course be lethal, and the number one source of carbon monoxide comes from exhaust fumes. The race to supplant fossil fuels with an efficient source of clean energy has never been more critically important. Speaking of a race against time, trees and other vegetation in the world's forests soak up heat-trapping carbon dioxide as they grow, helping to cool the planet. When trees are cut down improperly or suffer from drought, they release carbon monoxide into the atmosphere as they rot and die. There was a widespread drought in the Amazon rainforest in 2010 that was even worse than the dry spell of 2005 that at the time was called a once-in-a-century event. 
each of the two droughts had a bigger impact on global warming than the entire greenhouse gas output of the United States in one year. Right now, the Amazon, the world's largest rainforest, is a bit like an enormous sponge that absorbs carbon emissions and helps cool the planet. Even now, Although they are being cleared at an alarming rate, the rainforests of the Amazon still act as the lungs of the planet. Logging that's taking place there is being exacerbated by climate change. So what we're seeing is this vicious cycle being reinforced of illegal logging, um, changing weather patterns, rising temperatures, and as a result, the Amazon is drying, which is releasing more carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And we really need to put a stop to that. If we don't stop that, we could actually dangerously tilt the climate system. The Amazon desperately needs to be protected. And this is an issue for the entire world. The world cannot afford to depend on the efforts of crowdfunding campaigns to save the very air that we breathe. The ozone is a stratospheric layer that protects us by absorbing most of the ultraviolet radiation reaching the Earth from the sun. The ozone is being destroyed by certain manufactured chemicals containing either carbon, chlorine or fluorine. These are the notorious CFCs used in the manufacture of aerosol sprays, solvents and refrigerants. CFCs can deplete the ozone layer at a disquieting rate with a single molecule of chlorine capable of breaking apart thousands of molecules of ozone. These chemicals have a long lifetime in the atmosphere, meaning most of the CFCs released in the last 80 years are still making their way to the stratosphere, where they will add further to the destruction of the ozone. In 2014, there was news that the Montreal Protocol, which banned the use of CFCs, was starting to show signs of success. We must hope they are right. But meanwhile, make no mistake, Mankind has a long way to go if we're going to turn back the tide of climate change and clean up some of the mess created by our presence. In the last decades, there have been some positive signs of progress, but it does seem to be a case of two steps backwards for every step forward. In Lima, Peru in 2014, there were protests at the United Nations Climate Change Conference. Activists were furious that UN funds intended to combat climate change were instead being used to build coal-fired power plants. If you had the choice uh, to invest either in more efficient coal-fired power plants or renewable energy, knowing that by mid-century we have to bring down the CO2 emissions to zero, um, there's only one answer. You should invest into renewable energies, which will bring also employment in, into your country, in the countryside, and not only centralized uh, to a few companies. One of the biggest challenges for legislators worldwide is to divide responsibility for climate change between first world Western countries and emerging economies such as China and India.
最节省的、最能被大家接受的、最能形成社会共识的、改进空气质量的方法、政策，这是我最希望。It's not difficult to understand why Peruvians would be particularly environmentally conscious. For one thing, Peru's glaciers have lost more than a fifth of their mass in the last 30 years. Bad news for the 30 million people who live along the country's Pacific coastal desert and depend on the glaciers for survival. Esta agua eh, es para varios usos. El, el uso principal es la agricultura. Aquí estamos captando agua para poder irrigar 8.000 hectáreas de cultivo, de diferentes tipos de cultivo agrícolas, pero también la utilizamos para generar energía eléctrica. Tenemos una eh, mini central hidroeléctrica, ¿no? este, aguas abajo, que nos está generando 3 megas, megavatios de energía. ¿no? Y también tenemos este, captaciones para el uso de la población. This could be one of the many consequences of climate change, with glaciers and the polar ice caps melting at an alarming rate. Nowhere is this more apparent than the Antarctic Peninsula, which has seen an increase in temperatures of more than three degrees in the last half century. This may not sound like a lot, but water from the warmer ocean is corroding the ice at the rate of an additional 130 billion tons per year. And the rate is accelerating. 97% of the Antarctic Peninsula is still covered by ice. So it's not that it's all melting, it's all going to go away just like that. But a small amount of that ice melting is enough to make a significant contribution to the water going into the ocean, which makes a significant contribution to sea level rise. Scientists estimate that it could take between 200 to 1,000 years for the Antarctic Peninsula to melt completely, raising sea levels by as much as 10 feet with drastic impact on coastal cities. One of the biggest challenges globally from all of this warming, this melt, is that a lot of the human population lives near sea level. Um, a lot of big cities, a lot of agricultural land, a lot of vulnerable coastline. Temperatures will rise, as well as sea levels. A recent NASA study on climate change found that 10 of the warmest years between 1880 and 2014 fell between 1998 and 2014, with the year 2014 ranking as the warmest on record. The region around the North Pole is said to be heating up faster than anywhere else on Earth, with sea ice coverage there shrinking by almost a third in the last 40 years. Furthermore, researchers warn new threats to climate stability are about to be unleashed in the Arctic. Global warming in high latitudes is causing permafrost in Siberia and northern Canada to thaw. This will release plumes of methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere. These are not simple matters, even for the scientific community. But as custodians of the planet, are we not better to be safe rather than sorry?
floods and famine, tornadoes and war, an airplane crash or an earthquake natural disasters and man-made catastrophes, events that can cause enormous loss of life, destruction and hardship. In desperate hours, you'll become an eyewitness to some of the most noteworthy disasters of the last 100 years. The Earth really moves in this episode as we look at one of the most devastating of all natural cataclysms, the earthquake in all its destructive power. Of all the natural disasters we'll look at in this episode, none release more sheer destructive energy than an earthquake. After all, it takes a great deal of the Earth's energy for two of its magnetic plates to grind against each other long enough that they go snap and jolt the planet's outer crust for hundreds of square miles. great sadness, the great horror and heart-rending aftermath of the 2015 earthquakes in Nepal. The April 2015 Nepal earthquake, also known as the Gorkha earthquake, was responsible for over 8,000 deaths, with injuries many times over that. suffocating inside I couldn't breathe people die inside the I mean the dead body inside the house it's a nightmare yet even in the midst of such widespread tragedy there are beacons of hope a teenage boy is rescued from the rubble it's what we call an entombment so he wasn't specifically crushed but what he was was inside of a box a box with with heavy concrete all around him so the the us usaid teams uh, what we did is we worked side by side with the local teams and we were there to assist them uh, in getting this victim out across vast swathes of nepal entire villages were flattened rendering hundreds of thousands of people homeless Centuries-old buildings were obliterated at UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the Kathmandu Valley. The April 2015 earthquake also triggered an avalanche on Mount Everest, killing at least 19 and making for the deadliest day on the mountain in recorded history. We saw huge pieces of rock and ice coming down from phases of Makalu right over there over Camp 2. Well, I'm pretty well fucked. Uh, I fell through that hole. Thankfully, I didn't keep falling that way. I got trapped here instead. With this ledge, my arm I can't use. Sign of distraction. People, people going through the rumbles, trying to figure it out if we have anything left. The initial earthquake's magnitude was registered at 7.8. It was followed by continuous aftershocks within 15 to 20 minute intervals. Aftershocks can occur from days to weeks to, to months and sometimes even years after the main shock. So, I mean, it's, it's within the time period for sure to expect aftershocks like this. The capital city of Kathmandu, situated on a block of crust around 120 kilometers wide and 60 kilometers long, reportedly shifted three meters to the south in under 30 seconds. Thanks to this breathtaking footage, we can eyewitness this terrible tragedy.
Then, two weeks after the devastating quake in which more than 8,000 people were killed, Nepal was hit by another major earthquake, this one with a magnitude of 7.3. This time, over 100 people were killed and thousands injured. There was widespread damage to buildings and property in much of the shell-shocked nation. Earthquakes have always been with us, but it is really only in the last 50 years or so that their devastating impact has been captured so vividly, not only in photographs, but in moving images broadcast around the world, at first via television, and in the last 20 years or so, over the internet. Sichuan, the second largest of the Chinese provinces. It is located in the upper Yangtze River Valley in the southwestern part of the country. The Sichuan Province earthquake of May 2008. It occurred on a weekday in the middle of the afternoon. School and university classes were in full swing. Office workers had returned to their desks after lunch. 80 kilometers from the 7.6 million person megacity of Chengdu, a fault line began to rupture. resulting 7.9 magnitude earthquake in western China's mountainous Sichuan province would kill well over 8,000 people. Suddenly the ground just shaped. There was this awful noise and at first we thought maybe somewhere there was a landslide or something we never imagined it was an earthquake but it just wouldn't stop they got louder and louder and the rocks were just being thrown down the mountains at us <laughs> About 4,800,000 people were left homeless, and the scale of damage to property was estimated to be over $80 billion. When a disaster occurs on this sort of scale, it is hard to single out any one statistic as especially grim. Because the earthquake occurred in shallow, that means about 10 kilometers uh, beneath the ground. Uh, so the damage is usually uh, very strong, uh, devastating. In the 2008 Sichuan province earthquake, an estimated 10,000 children were trapped under rubble when school buildings collapsed. many would die there. Unsurprisingly, there was a public outcry. A subsequent government investigation concluded that one in five primary schools may have been shoddily constructed and unsafe. For months after the quake, more than 20,000 students had to do with makeshift schools and classrooms, but reconstruction efforts went ahead with impressive speed. But no amount of reconstruction 
could erase the memories of those desperate hours in May 2008. But what causes earthquakes? When people talk about a seismic shift, what are they actually talking about? At the very bottom of the oceans lie the uppermost layers of the surface of our planet. The Earth's outer layer is known as the crust. The crust covers the Earth's surface a bit like a cracked eggshell. The various pieces that make up the crust are called geological or tectonic plates. The tectonic plates fit together a bit like a jigsaw puzzle with some rough edges, known more scientifically as fault lines. The tectonic plates move continuously against one another. Most of the time they glide and slide along quite smoothly. Otherwise, there would be even more earthquakes. But every now and then, the tectonic plates catch and the pressure gradually but steadily builds up. Finally, the pressure becomes too much and the huge masses of rock which form the plates abruptly shift along the fault lines. This creates phenomenal waves of energy, spreading out in concentric circles, rather like waves in a pond if you throw a stone into the water. Recently, especially the Japanese scientists, uh, considering their past experience in earthquake prediction, they gave up uh, to make investment on earthquake prediction. And that's why they concentrated on studies related to understand the physics of earthquakes. Most earthquakes take place within the so-called ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean. At least once a year, Alaska experiences a 7.0 earthquake. California alone gets about 10,000 quakes a year, but most go unnoticed except by seismographs. Researchers at UC Berkeley are testing a prototype of an earthquake early warning system that California is pursuing years after places like Mexico and Japan already have them up and running. It detects the very beginnings of earthquakes using seismometers very close to the epicenter and then predicts the shaking that's going to follow so that you can push out a warning to all of those in harm's way. Indeed, while it is thought that globally there are as many as half a million earthquakes every year, only around 100,000 register on the Richter scale, and only about 100 of these cause any visible damage. was during the first golden age of television on an evening in May of 1960 in Chile as this newsreel footage shows that all hell broke loose. Rubble and ruin in the Pacific port of Concepcion in Chile, where she has suffered the worst series of earthquakes in all its history. Details of the damage cannot reveal the extent... The 1960 earthquake in Chile was the largest of the 20th century. The so-called rupture zone was estimated to be around 1,000 kilometers in diameter, from Lebu in central Chile to Puerto Aysen in the extreme south of the country. The severest destruction in Chile occurred in the Valdivia-Puerto Montt coastal region. Practically every building in the port town of Puerto Saavedra was destroyed by waves reaching heights of 11.5 meters, which carried the remains of houses as far as three kilometers inland. Most of the casualties in Chile and beyond were the result of large tsunamis triggered by the initial quake. As touched on, the so-called rupture zone was some 1,000 square kilometers, but the reverberations were literally felt across the Pacific Ocean. There was destruction on Easter Island, in the Samoa Islands, and in California. In the 
destruction wrought by the 1960 earthquake. Not only in Chile, but across the Pacific, the final death toll was 1,655 people. In terms of sheer human cost, the worst earthquake of modern times occurred in Haiti on a January evening of 2010. Death toll estimates begin at about 220,000 people. By the end of the day, at least 52 aftershocks measuring 4.5 or greater had been recorded. An estimated 3 million people were affected by the quake. Haitian government sources estimated that 250,000 residences and 30,000 commercial buildings collapsed or were severely damaged. The earthquake caused major damage in Port-au-Prince, Jacmel and other settlements in the region. Several notable landmark buildings were significantly damaged or completely demolished, including the Presidential Palace, the National Assembly Building, and the Port-au-Prince Cathedral. I think in, uh, in the next few days, people are going to be running out of food, out of water. I think we need help because it's urgent. The mortuaries of Port-au-Prince were overwhelmed with tens of thousands of bodies, which had to be buried in mass graves. As rescue efforts tailed off, vital supplies, medical care, and sanitation were all in short supply. It's a very shallow earthquake, and the, uh, that very shallow depth, coupled with the uh, size of the earthquake, meant that there was a very strong ground shaking. Actually, that fault is pretty similar to the San Andreas Fault in the sense that it, uh, it's what we call a strike-slip fault, where one side moves past the other in a horizontal fashion. Any major natural disaster brings tragedy. But in the case of Haiti, it seemed a particularly cruel twist of fate. Before the earthquake of 2010, Haiti was already a pretty desperate sort of place. To give some idea, only a third of the people in Port-au-Prince had regular access to drinking water. The island nation was 145th of 169 countries in the UN Human Development Index making it the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. So when epic disaster struck, the Haitians were not well prepared, to put it mildly. Delays in aid distribution led to protests from aid workers and survivors. There were instances of looting and outbursts of violence. The US and many other countries eventually responded to appeals for humanitarian aid. I have directed my administration to respond with a swift, coordinated, and aggressive effort to save lives. Practically all of Haiti's somewhat backwards communication systems, air, land, and sea transport facilities, hospitals, and electrical networks had been damaged by the earthquake the almost non-existent infrastructure and arguably some condescending attitudes on the part of relief agencies seemed to hamper rescue and aid efforts with logistical problems such as air traffic congestion making matters still worse. Usually we have 150 doctors for the hospital. Now I don't have 20. And yet, even in spite of recent political unrest, the indomitable island nation of Haiti has recovered to a perhaps unexpected degree. Most of the 1.5 million people displaced by the earthquake and living in makeshift tents now live in acceptable housing conditions. Haiti's reconstruction program is in full swing. Throughout Haiti, 
ambitious infrastructure programs are visible, including roads, bridges, and social housing projects. Like beleaguered Haiti, you would think that Kashmir, the setting of a prolonged, sometimes violent border dispute between India and Pakistan, already had enough problems. But a massive earthquake on October 8, 2005, only added to the province's woes. The devastating earthquake shook the Western Himalayas and adjoining regions in the morning. A magnitude 7.6 earthquake. It killed something like 80,000 people, injuring tens of thousands, and caused extensive damage in northern Pakistan, leaving millions homeless. I've lost my mother-in-law, my brother-in-law, his wife, his little baby child of eight months we've had, my aunt, my three uncles, his son. A reported 32,335 buildings collapsed in Kashmir, and in Pakistan, in places as far away from each other as Islamabad, Lahore, and Rawalpindi. Across the border in India, at least 1,300 people were killed and 6,000 injured. The international response was fast, but the remote mountainous terrain that typifies Kashmir just served to compound problems for recovery efforts, with rescue teams struggling to reach the injured. As you can see, it's total devastation, and uh, we're here to do what we can. We've just taken a one live man from the house behind me now and he's off to hospital, so we're gonna pack up our stuff and go and look for somewhere else now. We're struggling because of the remoteness, we're struggling because of logistics, we're now struggling because of the weather and the terrain. You know, as a, as a human being, as a human pro professional, these are absolutely desperate times. You know, we had torrential rain last night. I spoke to the general this morning at 2,000 meters here, which isn't far from here. Uh, temperature was minus three. These people were outside, they were wet, they're now cold. We're gonna have people dying, we're gonna have people coming down with diseases. Landslides and rockfalls damaged or destroyed mountain roads and highways, cutting off access to the region for several days. Even with today's technology, such as laser beams, which detect plate movement, and a machine called a seismometer, Earthquakes are still difficult to predict. As for being prepared, earthquake-proof buildings and roads, plus training in earthquake drills, all have their merits. Many a life has been saved in this way. But there are limits, especially when you take into account the awesome power of nature. Learning to live each day in the knowledge that desperate hours might just be around the corner is a vital part of what makes life so precious.
force majeure, also known as acts of God, earthquakes, volcanoes, avalanches, and droughts. Just to name some of the calamities that can befall, usually without warning. Then there are man-made catastrophes. The consequences of war spring rapidly to mind. Desperate Hours takes a hard-eyed look at some of the most dramatic disasters of the last 100 years. In this episode, you can run for cover, but you can't hide from the wild winds. That means hurricanes, cyclones, tornadoes, twisters, and typhoons. They are all pretty much different names for the same thing. Powerful windstorms. Well, no, not necessarily. To simplify things, tornadoes and twisters both occur over land, while cyclones, hurricanes, and typhoons form over the sea and mainly affect coastal regions, scattering as they move inland. The winds we'll be talking about on this show carry death, destruction, and heartbreak in their wake. We begin with the biggest blowout of this century, the hurricane they called Katrina. It was a tragedy on an enormous scale that left Louisiana, and indeed the entire United States, reeling in its aftermath. The highest winds and highest storm surge will have, are occurring now or have already occurred along the coast, gradually will be subsiding later today. Reaching wind speeds of up to 175 miles per hour, Katrina is ranked as the third most destructive tropical cyclone to make landfall in the US on record. The other two were the Labor Day hurricane of 1935 and Hurricane Camille in 1969. It is estimated that some 1,836 people died in the August 2005 hurricane and the ensuing floods. Millions more were rendered homeless along the Gulf Coast and in New Orleans, which was the site of the highest death toll. It's all just torn up, everything. This is about the worst one I've seen. We're not used to seeing stuff like this. There is a humanitarian crisis unfolding here in New Orleans. There are thousands of people trapped, running short of food and water, waiting for a bus out of here. For the first time, the operation on these streets is changing from rescuing the living to recovering the dead. The problem is that most of the dead are either underneath this water or trapped in these houses. Now, until this flood water is drained, they will remain there, the true death toll won't be known, and the flood water may not be drained for several months. America's party capital was badly flooded as the levee system failed in spectacular fashion. In some instances, hours after the storm had already moved inland. Approximately 80% of the city and many neighboring townships were flooded, with the floodwaters remaining for weeks to come. In terms of property damage, the worst of it occurred along a chain of Mississippi beachfront towns. It's just amazed me how it covered houses, cars, cars moving down the street, just terrible. Well, I didn't think it would be as bad as it was, but it came, came through when, uh, when Ty was coming in. Our house got about a foot of water in it. Everything else around from our um, house down got about waist deep or higher. Look at the destruction. <laughs> Tore up. Anything else you'd like to add? Many government officials came in for criticism after what was seen as a slow and slapdash response effort. 
Ray Najan, the mayor of New Orleans, Kathleen Blanco, the governor of Louisiana, and US President George W. Bush were all lambasted. The president commented that New Orleans had dodged a bullet, yet this was after the White House was informed that the levees in New Orleans had broken and the city was flooding. Vice President Dick Cheney's office instructed a Mississippi electricity cooperative to restore power to a pipeline that sends oil and gas to the Northeast. Doesn't sound so bad. Well, except for the fact that it delayed the restoration of power to two rural hospitals. For the survivors just trying to stay alive, or even just afloat, the situation must have seemed helpless at times. Officials at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration later declared that Katrina was the most destructive storm to ever strike the United States. The trauma was certainly real in Myanmar a few years after when Cyclone Nargis struck. A cyclone is a tropical storm, specifically a violent rotating windstorm. The word violent somehow doesn't suffice to describe the utter devastation caused by Nargis. stands on record as the worst natural disaster ever recorded in Myanmar. Making landfall on Friday in May 2008, the destruction was almost incomprehensible. And the fatalities? Estimates vary, but even the most conservative issued by the Myanmar government put the death toll at over 84,000 people, with another 53,000 plus listed as missing. Some 37 townships suffered significant damage, with the UN estimating that as many as 2.4 million people were affected. With winds in excess of 120 miles per hour, Cyclone Nargis became one of Asia's deadliest storms by hitting land at one of the lowest points above sea level in Myanmar, triggering a storm surge that reached some 25 miles inland. Those on the ground didn't need to hear statistics. They knew they were in the midst of a tragedy on a profoundly epic scale. Natural disasters, with their random, indiscriminate brutality, are one thing, but mankind's response is another. And this was one time where politics made a tragic situation worse than it had to be. We now estimate that two million people have faced famine or disease as a result of the lack of cooperation of the Burmese authorities. This is completely unacceptable. There must be unfettered access to humanitarian agencies. Uh, the United States has made an initial aid contribution, but we want to do a lot more. We're prepared to move uh, U.S. Navy assets uh, to help uh, find those who've lost their lives, to help find the missing, and to help stabilize the situation. But in order to do so, uh, the military junta must allow our disaster assessment teams into the country. As a result of the cyclone, the bulk of health facilities in affected areas were either completely destroyed or greatly damaged. 
elements now to make us very, very worried. We've got massive displacement of people. We've got inadequate water supplies. We've got people living in flooded situations. We have very little sanitation there. We have people displaced and living in crowded centers um, or in schools. But when the ruling military junta refused entry into Myanmar by Western humanitarian aid workers, the plight of survivors became still more desperate. With the response of aid agencies thwarted, it became all too clear that in the wake of disaster, humanitarian assistance can't come fast enough. Hurricanes usually have their origins in tropical regions. They form over warm ocean water around 26 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And once they have gathered momentum, can be up to 600 miles across. They are comprised of strong winds spiraling inwards and upwards at up to 200 miles per hour. Hurricanes typically last for about a week, gathering heat and energy as they move over the warm ocean waters. Evaporation from the sea just serves to increase their power. The whirlwind revolves around its center, or the renowned eye of a hurricane. They twist and turn in anti-clockwise fashion in the northern hemisphere, but in a clockwise direction in the southern hemisphere. The center of the storm, or eye, is actually the tempest's calmest spot, where there are only light winds and generally fair weather. Yet once it makes landfall, the hurricane's heavy rain, strong winds, and large waves can cause devastation on an almost unimaginable scale. A tornado, on the other hand, is a rapidly spinning tube of air, which touches both the ground and the clouds above. In the US, they are often referred to as twisters. The most violent tornadoes can attain wind speeds of up to 300 miles per hour. They can demolish large buildings, uproot trees, and pick up and hurl vehicles hundreds of feet away as if they were mere playthings. The tornado's path of destruction can be anywhere in excess of one mile wide and some 50 miles long. 1,000 tornadoes are reported in the United States in a typical year. Fortunately, only 2% of these are labeled violent tornadoes. The majority of tornadoes form from thunderstorms. In the United States, for example, when warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico and cool, dry air from Canada meet, that's when the trouble begins. When these two air masses get together, they produce instability in the atmosphere. A change of wind direction and an increase in its speed creates a horizontal spinning effect in the lower atmosphere. Air rising within the resulting updraft tilts this rotating air column from horizontal to vertical. Tornadoes can occur at any time of the year and no terrain is considered safe. That said, the U.S. averages more tornadoes annually than any other country in the world. A world and time away from military hunters and political strife, the postcard picture-perfect Florida Keys. The setting for scenes of destruction every bit as powerful as anything captured on film. That was the story when the winds whipped up to a Category 4 hurricane back in September 1960. It swept over Florida with terrifying force. Rain fell in torrents and the wind reached a velocity of more than 120 miles an hour. When Hurricane Donna struck here, it had already caused death and destruction in Puerto Rico and other places in the Caribbean. As it lashed the Florida Keys, it repeated its vicious performance. The damage done was bound to run into millions of dollars. While Britain was basking in a few days of Indian summer, the east coast of the United States, including New York, suffered a trail of destruction as Donna continued on her ferocious course.
Hurricane Donna had more serious consequences. This wild wind still holds the record for maintaining major hurricane status in the Atlantic Basin for the longest period, nine days in total. Late in the afternoon on a Sunday in May 2011, the town of Joplin, Missouri was the stage for the kind of tornado that is capable of leveling whole neighborhoods in minutes. Lost my house, lost my garage, lost my friend. When they say that it sounds like a freight train coming, I, that's what I'd always heard, but I never, mm -hmm. it is exactly what it sounds like in the shake, uh -huh. the house is shaken. Leveling suburbs in minutes is exactly what the Joplin tornado did. This town of 50,000 people lay directly in the path of the tornado, which was three quarters of a mile wide at its worst. The tornado steamrolled over Joplin with winds in excess of 200 miles per hour, destroying more than 900 homes, killing over 150, cutting off telephones and electricity supplies, and knocking out a hospital. The destruction left behind a ravaged landscape that seemed surreal, almost alien. there was another fascinating dimension to this natural disaster. With the town of Joplin known as the buckle on the Bible Belt, many of the survivors claim to have had supernatural experiences. Both children and adults claim to have been protected by angels they call the butterfly people or butterfly angels. These butterfly angels seemed real to some and therapists did not try to dissuade believers. Their goal, as always, was to help people to process the trauma they'd experienced. So, whatever works. Why do violent hurricanes often have such safe, non-threatening sounding names? Katrina, for instance, or Hurricane Sandy, unofficially known as Superstorm Sandy. Sandy sounds like somebody's sister with freckles and a ponytail. But let's not be naive. Hurricane Sandy was the most lethal and devastating hurricane of the Atlantic hurricane season for 2012. Moreover, Sandy is listed as being, financially speaking, the second most costly hurricane in United States history. Sandy was formed in the Central Caribbean on October 22, 2012, and intensified into a hurricane as it traveled north through Jamaica, eastern Cuba, and the Bahamas. So sobre Jamaica con una intensidad de huracán categoría 1, con 130 km por hora vientos máximos sostenidos y rachas de hasta 150, 160. The storm is uh, certainly um... It's still a hurricane, for one thing, and it's uh, now spinning just north of the Bahamas. And um, you can see from this satellite picture with uh, Carolina up here and Florida here, it's, it's becoming a very large storm system. 
Hurricane Sandy is still about 200 miles off this coast, but you can feel her coming. Those waves have been measured at 35 feet just further out. Now, when that's combined with a high tide later and winds of around 80 miles an hour, they're going to carry those waves right over this boardwalk and smash into Long Island here. When it made landfall in Cuba and the Caribbean, it did what you'd expect of any Category 1 hurricane. It left a path of destruction in its wake and was to blame for several fatalities. The beleaguered island nation of Haiti, still reeling from an earthquake earlier that year, suffered 51 casualties. But it was in New York and New Jersey where Sandy undoubtedly did the most damage of all. Concerned citizens and emergency services personnel had watched carefully as Sandy was reclassified as a tropical storm before strengthening again to a Category 1 hurricane. Informally, it became known as Superstorm Sandy. And when it finally hit the eastern seaboard on October 27th, no amount of precautions and preparations were going to stop it from wreaking havoc on an enormous scale, killing at least 117 people and leaving many, many more destitute and traumatized. The beach might be up this street. They call it the city by the sea. Parts of it will soon be in the sea when high tide brings a huge surge of water. They're already getting out whatever way they can. We stayed with a great cousin last night. She has five kids of her own. I don't know what I'm gonna do. So we're here. I'm trying to get some gas in my car. I'm going, I'm, get, I'm getting out of the city. The city don't love me. I've been here my whole life. It's nothing. My ocean walked through my house and I lost everything I own in 27 years and I'm here five days and living in the street. I'm living in my car. It's a lot worse than a few possessions, you know, because these can be replaced. But the community has been very helpful. You can see over there, all the organizations is giving food and blankets to everybody. So, it's very heartwarming seeing the support of the community. People think of hurricanes, they usually visualize a raging wind, swaying palm trees, and perhaps airborne debris. And while that does occur, that's not what takes people's lives. Water does. In fact, 90% of the fatalities in the United States due to hurricanes is due to water. Of course, most by drowning. Also want to emphasize that of that, 50% comes from storm surge. We passed through the worst, you know, it's over us now, I guess, right? In this episode of Desperate Hours, we have seen coastal regions ravaged by hurricanes. have seen whole towns flattened by tornadoes. The only form of defense is to flee before they arrive or take cover. The force majeure has spoken.
catastrophes, cataclysms, calamities, disasters all, each capable of creating destruction, devastation, and many a desperate hour. Some are natural phenomena, such as tornadoes, volcanoes, and earthquakes. Then there are man-made troubles, such as war, which remind us of man's inhumanity to man. In desperate hours, we stare into the abyss and contemplate these inconvenient truths of life on Earth. In this installment, we batten down the hatches and run for dry land as we look at the damage a little water can do, or rather, a great deal of it. The European Union's flood directive defines a flood as a covering of water of land not normally covered by water. But that rather tepid description simply doesn't do justice to the terror unleashed by raging currents and flash flooding. So then, let's get down to cases. Rio de Janeiro, a place celebrated in song and in the popular imagination for samba and carnival, bronzed beach bodies, and the statue of Christ the Redeemer overlooking it all. Of course, it is also known for its darker side, the grinding poverty of the favela shanty towns, for example. But in January 2011, the state of Rio de Janeiro added flash floods to its global perception. That's when a densely populated region on a steep, hilly area around 40 miles north of the city itself was inundated with torrential rains. This in turn triggered flash floods and mudslides responsible for hundreds of fatalities. The death toll made the January 2011 floods the worst ever single-day natural disaster in Brazil's history. Some of the hardest hit spots were the towns of Teresopolis and Nova Friburgo, where some 300 millimeters of rain fell in the space of just a few hours. Torrential rains come about when a storm system crossing west to east over southern Brazil sucks in a moist southerly flow of air from the Atlantic Ocean. Both rescue and aid workers and environmental building specialists all seem to agree the death toll was needlessly high. The hillside areas around Rio lacked effective early warning systems or community organizations that might have helped residents evacuate as the rains intensified. Menos três e meia da manhã e começou a descer um pé d'água lá de cima do morro e pessoas pedindo socorro, socorro e sem poder fazer nada, cara. A tromba d'água foi incrível. Ah, foi um desastre. Ninguém esperava. Era um rio pequeno, não aparentava ter problema nenhum. De repente, causou um caos. Aniquilou a população. Perdi 23 parentes, perdi meu pai, perdi meu filho. Weeks after the disaster, many communities remained isolated due to heavy landslides on principal access roads. Dozens of families were thus still dependent on helicopters to deliver emergency health care and essentials, like food and potable water. 
In Teresopolis, the townspeople cleared debris in the streets using shovels and brushes. While in Nova Friburgo, all families could do was watch and cry as their homes were demolished. Depois dessa lição, eu acho que a fraternidade, o amor, a compaixão vão ser as bases que vão edificar esta nova Friburgo. Com a ajuda de todos, nós vamos reconstruir essa cidade. January rains in Brazil are becoming increasingly severe, with floods becoming routine. Whether or not the heavy rains can be attributed to climate change, the fact is, urban planning has been weighed down on the Brazilian political agenda for a long time. doesn't mean things are automatically better in the so-called first world. On the morning of August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast of the United States. The city of New Orleans was one of the most badly affected areas. Technically speaking, although about half of New Orleans is actually above sea level, the Big Easy is completely surrounded by water, and its average elevation, to use the technical term, is about six feet below. At different times over the course of the 20th century, the Army Corps of Engineers had built a system of levees and seawalls that were meant to keep the city from flooding. Some of the levees, especially those along the Mississippi River, stood strong in 2005. But those intended to hold back Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Bourne, and the swamps and marshes to the city's east and west were nowhere near as robust. Floodwaters seeped through the soil under some of the levees and swept others away completely. Soon, low-lying places, such as the now infamous Ninth Ward, were under so much water, people scrambled to their attics or even rooftops for safety. Mayor Ray Najem declared that the Superdome, a downtown sports stadium located on relatively high ground, would serve as a shelter of last resort for people who could not leave the city. In effect, that meant the poorest people of New Orleans. Conditions in the overcrowded Superdome were soon less than hygienic, with food and water in short supply. Lawlessness and looting spread throughout the city. The National Guard was mobilized to restore law and order in what quickly became a hostile and unsafe environment. Tensions ran high, and many felt vulnerable. We can go and help in Sadami, but we can't help our own people. We've been sleeping in the street for five days and nights. If you're sleeping at nighttime, you got a handful of canned goods. People trying to come in and get them. You know, I look at it this way, it's like a battle zone, you know. Something like one million people were made homeless by Katrina, with around 1,200 people drowning in the floodwaters. There was much criticism of the authorities for their handling of the disaster. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, took days to establish operations in New Orleans. And even then, did not seem to have a sound plan of action. But criticism went all the way to the highest office in the land. The country stands with you. We'll do all in our power to help you. 
His handling of the disaster left a mark on George Bush's presidential legacy. And in a telling footnote, former New Orleans mayor Ray Nagin was indicted and imprisoned in 2014 for 20 of 21 charges of wire fraud, bribery, and money laundering, spanning his two terms as mayor, including, of course, Katrina. On a certain level, the causes of flooding are easy to wrap your head around. Floods are caused by an imbalance of the hydrological system, the pattern in which water circulates from the clouds to the soil, then to bodies of water such as rivers and oceans, and then back to the clouds. When more water flows through the hydrological system than it has capacity for, then floods are the result. That imbalance is most often the result of torrential rain, with rivers, streams or reservoirs overflowing due to unusually high rainfall. But also factors such as excess water from melting snow or ice jams in rivers. Essentially, there are two types of floods. One is river flooding, where just as it sounds, water spills over the edges of a river. The other is the flash flood and is far more dangerous, responsible for the majority of fatalities and large-scale destruction associated with floods. Flash floods occur when a wall of water rapidly sweeps over an area. Another factor causing floods is urbanization. By replacing grass and dirt with concrete, such as buildings, roads and parking lots, there is insufficient soil to soak up rainwater. When it does overflow, the result is an inconvenience at best, disaster at worst. So rainfall that would be absorbed in a rural area can cause calamity in an urban environment. The need to do something about this problem and threats to the environment in general is something that has slowly but surely gained acceptance worldwide. Una actitud solamente lo digo en en buen sentido verde entre comillas. No es una actitud verde, es mucho más. Es decir, cuidar el ambiente significa una actitud de ecología humana. But as the old saying goes, fine words butter no parsnips. The race to do something about the melting polar ice caps, which could cause massive flooding, unknown before in recorded history, is like a race against a doomsday clock. We are, potentially, dying by inches. In these years, it's contributing this much every year to sea level rise. And then you, you think, well, this is not that much. But if you, if you have 10 years and all of a sudden it's that much, and then you get more global warming, perhaps, and it, it goes faster and faster. And in general, people don't need to be concerned about the Greenland ice sheet because it will be around for a long time. But even if, uh, if one tenth of it would melt in the, in the following 100 years, then there will be huge cities, a very sh a large share of the, the population of the world that uh, will get in trouble because of this uh, sea level rise. Half a century ago, a massive flood affected whole swathes of Germany's coastal regions, and in particular, the city of Hamburg. This was around the time the Beatles were paying their dues in Hamburg's nightclubs, but that's another story. This is what it looks like, mile upon mile of flood, thousands of homes isolated. With railways underwater and other communications cut, rescue work has been made doubly difficult. The North Sea flood of 1962 destroyed over 60,000 houses and the death toll came to 315. Many of the lucky survivors of the North Sea floods would later refer to the military rescue helicopters as the Flying Angels. 
Interesting to note, this was the first such crisis in Germany since the Second World War in which army personnel and machinery were deployed in such numbers. If you want to define the difference between a disaster and a tragedy, there's an inevitability about a disaster, whereas a tragedy is something that was caused by or could have been avoided were it not for human error. In mid-June of 2013, flash floods and their resulting landslides killed thousands and made many more homeless in the Uttarakhand state and region of northern India. Many of those killed were Hindu pilgrims visiting the Kedonath Shrine. High up in the mountains, it is said that Lord Shiva moved there to be away from the things of man. It was a multi-day cloudburst with driving rain which caused the destructive and lethal floods and landslides. Though other regions of India experienced the flood and parts of western Nepal and western Tibet were subject to heavy rainfall, the vast majority of the casualties occurred in Uttarakhand. Of course, there wasn't much local officials could have done about the cloudburst. But hundreds of thousands of Hindu pilgrims make the journey to Uttarakhand's temple towns every summer. The hills are also a popular place to go to escape the scorching summer heat. But most tourists leave in July, the start of monsoon season. Only in 2013, the rain started early. Environmental activists said landslides had been made worse due to the unchecked development of the region. Many others complained that the government's relief efforts had been slow and uncoordinated, despite flooding being a regular occurrence. <laughs> Uh, some 100,000 pilgrims and tourists were trapped for days in the valleys leading to Hindu pilgrimage sites because of the damage done to roads and bridges. On December 26, 2004, millions of people awoke from their post-Christmas Day slumber to horrifying news out of Southeast Asia. It began in the depths of the Indian Ocean with a 9.0 magnitude earthquake. According to the US Geological Survey, 
the energy it released was equivalent to that of 23,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. forgiven for thinking of the 2005 tsunami not as an earthquake but as a series of tidal waves. However, a tsunami is not the same thing as a tidal wave. It's a series of destructive ocean waves triggered by an underwater earthquake, landslide, volcanic eruption, or we'd better hope not anytime soon by the impact of a giant meteor plunging into the sea. But such distinctions wouldn't have seemed very important to anyone caught up in the 2005 tsunami. Rooms filled up in 30 seconds, first of all, to about three foot, and then we all got out of the rooms, and then uh, um, one of our friends has had to go to the hospital. We couldn't get out of the room. He, he woke up and was uh, asleep on his bed, lying in, uh, on, woke up in, in the water. Had to throw the TV through the window to climb out. Hundreds of thousands were killed in minutes, and millions lost their homes as wave after destructive wave crashed into the coastlines of some 11 Indian Ocean countries. With ruthless efficiency, the waves dragged people out to sea, drowned others on the beach or in their homes, and demolished property on an unimaginable scale. In low-lying areas of western coastal Sumatra, including the city of Banda Aceh, virtually the entire population of 300,000 was affected in one way or another. Aid workers from across the globe rushed to help as soon as they could, but the scale and ferocity of the destruction was overwhelming. The destruction and the stuff that I've seen here is, is much more horrific than anything I've seen in, in combat. The scale of the 2005 tsunami is still hard to comprehend. A study by the World Bank estimated the cost of the destruction of property and businesses in Sumatra alone at more than $4.4 billion. More than 10 years later, and relief and recovery efforts in affected areas are still ongoing. Rains will fall and riverbanks will burst. But retaining walls can be built, and urban planning should ensure waterways are not blocked. Plus, drainage systems should be regularly cleared of litter and debris. Natural disasters will be with us for a long time to come. But the death and destruction caused by Brazilian floods and landslides, the flooding after Hurricane Katrina, and the northern Indian floods could all have been reduced by environmental awareness in building codes, better coordinated relief efforts, and so on. Après moi le déluge, or after me the flood. As French King Louis XV once said, in what is seen as the ultimate in irresponsible attitude. It's like so many of the environmental issues that confront us. Prevention will always be better than a cure.
Extraordinary events causing great loss of life, damage, or hardship, like a flood, a tornado, an airplane crash, or an earthquake. Awesome reminders of the terrible power of nature and grim lessons in mankind's capacity for destruction. In desperate hours, you'll be an eyewitness to some of the greatest disasters of the last 100 years. In this episode, we contemplate from a safe distance the lethal majesty of volcanoes, one of the planet's most destructive as well as spectacular natural forces. It is estimated there are up to 4,000 volcanoes on Earth, of which annually about 50 are active volcanoes above sea level, emitting in their eruptions millions of tons of dust, ash, and gases, and endangering the lives and property of millions of people. Montserrat, an emerald island in the Caribbean Sea, described by tourist guidebooks as late as the 1990s as a tropical paradise. The beauty of Montserrat must have enchanted voyagers already in 1493, when it was discovered by Christopher Columbus. It was the volcano that changed the tropical paradise into hell on Earth. Although geologists believed that the Sufria Hills volcano was inactive. On 18 July 1995, after four quiet centuries, this sleeping giant suddenly awoke. The subsequent huge eruption spewed out large volumes of pyroclastic material over a radius of 15 kilometers. The following apocalypse especially hit the capital city of Plymouth, which will never forget this day. Plymouth was buried in several meters of mud and ash. The day changed into night. The quiet atmosphere of a town carelessly bathing in the sun just a while beforehand suddenly changed into the worst nightmare. Look up, and what I saw, I left the cabin running. I ran away from the mountain coming down. The point on which I decide to leave the island is after I've been, been over in the hills and see the last Paraclastic flow that make me move. Two thirds of the population had to be evacuated, hastily leaving their homes, which most of them never returned to. I was living in the buffer zone, right? The, um, the zone which they would move next if activity from the volcano increases and right now they have evacuated that zone. Pero ahora yo no sé qué van a hacer ahora porque evacuaron desde yo vivía, mi mamá vivía en el parte en el norte donde no evacuaron todavía. Because of the volcano, the number of Montserrat inhabitants fell from 12,000 to 4,500 people. However, none of the people who refused to leave their beloved Caribbean island knew that the fury of the volcano was not over. Almost two years later, on 15 June 1997, a new explosion shook the volcano with a subsequent outburst of magma. Flows of lava literally ate into the hill on its way. And again, a massive mud flow covered the capital Plymouth and surrounding villages. Frightened people watched 
as lava flowing down the volcano slopes flattened villages and burned houses. On that day, Sufria Hills claimed 19 lives, burning them alive in hot lava. At the time of the disaster, the victims were in the forbidden area where they had fields and homes which they refused to leave. They took the risk and were unlucky, which cost them their lives. Further eruptions reinforced the flows of hot lava, which gradually buried the lively town of Plymouth on the shore. The formerly vibrant and easygoing town now witnessed apocalyptic scenes of destroyed streets covered in endless gray. Although volcanic eruptions still occasionally occur, the inhabitants of the island hope that the worst is over. Iceland is known as the land of ice and fire. The icy white landscape evokes a sense of purity and innocence. As if from time to time, it had to be stained with ash coming from volcanic eruptions. In the territory of Iceland, there are 30 active volcanic systems. Iceland is located at the top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where two different tectonic plates meet. This contributes to the very intense volcanic and seismic activity in Iceland, which is not to be found anywhere else on Earth. The eruption of 1973, which took place on Hime Island, is believed to be one of the world's worst natural disasters of the 20th century. On 21 January 1973, around 8 p.m., the island was shaken by several small, almost imperceptible shocks. Despite this, nobody expected a catastrophe, the extent of which was to come. Does this volcano come as a complete surprise to you, or did you have any warning? There was no warning whatsoever until 10 o'clock yesterday evening. Uh, which was the earthquake? Yeah. Yes. Uh, how much danger do you think this uh, eruption represents to the country, the island and its livelihood? It's quite difficult to say. It uh, depends on the volume of lava produced and on wind direction. So there's a possibility that it won't be very dangerous? It's quite, yes, I, I think so, actually. At 2 a.m. on 23 January 1973, a new crack appeared in the eastern side of the volcano Eldfell, whose name means Mountain of Fire in Icelandic. It was less than a kilometer away from the center of Hime City, whose citizens were caught absolutely unprepared. Red-hot lava started to flow from the crack at appalling speed. Volcanic dust fell on the roofs of houses. 
the frightened citizens of the island were woken by police sirens and evacuated to safety off the island. They were lucky. They were all successfully evacuated in time. As there had been a strong storm around the island the previous day, most of the fishing boats had stayed in the harbor. They were used to save lives. Older and helpless people were transported by air, others on the boats. They watched as streams of lava flowed through the streets of their town destroying their houses and property, ruining their lives. The catastrophe changed the lives of all 5,000 inhabitants of the island forever. Many have never returned for fear of further eruptions, and others have had to start life again from scratch. Recently, we were again reminded of the power and presence of Icelandic volcanoes. The volcanic eruption of Eyjafjallajökull in 2010 resulted in a vast volcanic ash cloud, which blocked air travel throughout Europe. Today, most of the UK remains covered by the ash cloud. Eruption uh, it may stop tomorrow, but it may continue to disrupt air traffic for weeks or months. We don't know anything. We don't know how to get home. We don't know how to get any information uh, about what to do. And we don't have anywhere to stay. The explosive activity might drop down for a period of time, but then we will have uh, uh, over a, maybe an extensive period of time, months to even years, uh, intermittent explosive eruptions. Iberia put us up for a few nights and gave us food put us on today's flight, today's flight's cancelled, and now they say they're not going to give us any more accommodation or any food. It was not a strong eruption, but according to seismologists, another eruption of similar scope is just a matter of time. Volcanic eruptions have always fascinated and terrified people. These natural giant fireworks emit streams of bubbling, boiling lava, traveling at speeds of up to 165 meters per second. As the lava spreads out in a breathtaking show, it can cause destruction, death, and doom. This flaming, bubbling hell turns into vast streams a lethal mixture of volcanic ash, solid lava, mud, and water, which sweeps down the mountain slopes like an unstoppable river. How and where are volcanoes born? They begin life at a depth of between 80 to 220 kilometers below the Earth's surface, in a place known as the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is actually a viscous mantle of the Earth, which allows for the movement of the Earth's lithospheric plates. Without the asthenosphere, the plates would not be able to move, and the renewal of the Earth's crust would not be possible. Where the plates touch each other, slide past one another, move under or over one another. This is where the Earth's crust is so broken that magma can find its way up to the surface. This is how a volcanic crater develops.
Indonesia has been seen as symbolic of volcanic disasters ever since the eruption of the legendary Krakatoa volcano in 1883. This land, like Iceland, is referred to as the land of volcanoes and lies in the Sunda Strait, where there is frequent Strombolian activity. Every now and then, some of them erupt, causing a local disaster. The same applies to Merapi Volcano, literally meaning Fire Mountain in the local language, is arguably Indonesia's most dangerous volcano with a history of deadly eruptions. The volcano is frequently active with eruptive episodes occurring every few years, posing a threat to more than one million people living on the slopes of the volcano. This type of activity has occurred frequently in past years, usually lasting for a few weeks or months each time. On 26 October 2010, Merapi violently erupted, spewing flows of hot rock and gas kilometers away from the summit and devastating the surrounding area. The huge explosion caused a collapse of its lava dome and red hot clouds of ash rolled down the slopes of the mountains, burning everything that stood in their way. They devastated tens of villages and all the fertile fields on the slopes. Further explosions continued daily for approximately two weeks before activity started to decrease in the middle of November. Like in 94, it was the dome collapse and the seismicity and also the deformation, there was no signal. At the peak of activity on November 5, pyroclastic flows traveled 16 kilometers from the summit, destroying everything in their path. During the 2010 eruptive episode, more than 300 people were killed, making this most recent eruption the greatest volcanic disaster at Merapi in 80 years. Over 300,000 people were evacuated from their homes within a 20 kilometer radius of the volcano and moved to temporary shelters in safer areas away from the fiery reaches of the volcano. Saya ke sini karena kena abu dari Merapi itu. Lantas saya menjadi sesak nafas dan pusing. Ya dari apa? Lampang Gunung Merapi ini ada debu. Terus ada riwayat tekanan darah tinggi juga ya. Pengembalian psikisnya yang sekali menjaga. Takutnya ada yang trauma, yang ngedrop. Target kita di sini anak-anak sama manula. Thanks to the detailed geological monitoring and timely warnings by the Indonesian Center of Volcanology and the resulting rapid evacuations, it is estimated that 10 to 20,000 lives were saved. All time that Merapi keeps two different, two different uh, activity. One eruption, explosion, and one storm collapse. Both are dangerous. So what does the future hold for Merapi and the people living on its hazardous slopes?
scientists face a challenge to unravel the driving forces behind Merapi's activity. Past eruptions hold the key to future eruptive styles, so unlocking the secrets of what lies behind Merapi's activity will help volcanologists to prevent further catastrophes occurring. The devastating explosions accompanying volcanic eruptions can completely destroy prosperous ecosystems and whole civilizations. One such volcano is Mount Nyirangongo, elevation 3,470 meters in war-torn Congo, whose last eruption occurred in January 2002. In that eruption, Lava appeared on the surface directly at the edge of Goma City in Minigi, where it started to flow out of the earth and cut the city in two. Many people had no place to flee and suffocated. Lava streams got as far as Lake Kivu, The number of victims reached about a hundred. Thousands of people lost their homes. Everything, they've lost everything, even for those houses of which they're still standing, but they've, they've lost the roof, the rooftops, and they've lost their, they've lost their belongings. Yes, they've lost everything. My house is still down. Now I don't know what I can do. Now I don't know why my family was going. Now I try to see some way if I can find to him. Niragongo is one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. It is unique for its lava crater lake and highly liquid lava which you cannot escape from. Experts warn that if Niragongo shows its true power, Goma City with its one million inhabitants will become a contemporary Pompeii. Another threat with potentially inconceivable consequences is Yellowstone National Park in the USA. The national park is located on a supervolcano. Yellowstone is the supervolcano's caldera, under which there is the largest magma chamber in the world. It's never possible to predict a volcano, to say the volcano will erupt in three years or in 25 years. We cannot tell the future. We can only monitor the present. Queste aree eh, possono dare origine come massime eruzioni alle uniche eruzioni che possono avere effetti catastrofici globali, al pari di grandi impatti meteoritici. According to scientists, the likelihood of the supervolcano erupting is five to ten times higher than the likelihood of Earth being hit by an asteroid. We can only hope that neither we nor our descendants will experience the eruption of the supervolcano, which would bring death to hundreds of thousands of people and horrible consequences to cope with for millions of people, not only in America, but worldwide. These are volcanoes, time bombs, where it is actually just a question of time before an eruption of devastating extent will occur. And what's more, we know well that man cannot fight against nature, but must learn to live with it.
Force majeure, also known as acts of God. Cyclones, floods, earthquakes, storms, volcanoes, and droughts. Then there are man-made calamities, such as wars and their terrible consequences. Desperate Hours examines some of the more noteworthy cataclysmic events of the last 100 years. In this installment, we turn up the heat to examine a natural phenomenon that is both a friend and a foe to humankind. Some two to four thousand years ago, our ancestors had learned how to create and control fire, a step vital to human development. We won't be going back quite that far in this episode, but we do travel back in time to remind ourselves that dangerous and deadly fires are a fact of life, as immutable as the wind, the rain, or the seasons. In Australia, bushfires are an inconvenient fact of life, but now and then they spiral into tragedy on a national scale. The weekend in Australia. It's a time of relaxation that occupies a special place in the Aussie mindset. Off go the work clothes, shorts and flip-flops take their place, screw-top wine bottles are liberated and barbecues are fired up. But for people in the state of Victoria, relaxation and certainly barbecues took a back seat when the Black Saturday bushfires began raging on Saturday, February 7, 2009. seen a movie it's just terrible absolutely terrible couldn't do much really because for safety reasons we just couldn't um, go in the, into the bush too long because we've got to worry about our own safety oh there's heaps of devastation but as far as what's happening now it's quiet indeed the fires began on a day when several places in victoria recorded their highest temperatures in 150 years since 1859 when the keeping of such records began Spoken of today as Australia's worst ever bushfire disaster, the fires resulted in the deaths of some 173 people, with over 400 people injured, many of them seriously. Following the horrific events of February 7, 2009 and its repercussions, the day has become known forever as Black Saturday. The people we'll cope, uh, we've all had our cries and we'll have that for a long time yet, but to lose friends, to lose friends' children, uh, a lot of people are not going to come back. 
As with any tragedy of this scale, the ray of hope came from the fact that help and assistance came from across the globe. Pemberian bantuan satu juta dolar bagi upaya rekonstruksi dan rehabilitasi, utamanya sekolah-sekolah yang terbakar, serta pengiriman satu tim identifikasi korban bencana, disaster victims identifications dari Mabes Polri. Some of the fires are thought to have been started deliberately. Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said if arsonists were to blame, it amounted to mass murder. And anyone perceived as being in any way responsible was in for close scrutiny. Then, as now, however, no matter how bad things get, if you have to face a disaster, it's probably better to do so from the comparative advantage of a first world economy. Then again, sometimes it's just a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and no amount of privilege or power can protect you. Case in point, the first years of the millennium and a group of party people out to let their hair down to the sounds of Great White. Ring any musical bells? Well, Great White were a hard rock band with big hair that had a hit with Once Bitten Twice Shy at the tail end of the 1980s. Still performing more than a decade later, they weren't quite drawing the same capacity crowds as in their heyday. Nonetheless, hundreds of people went to see them one Thursday night in Rhode Island at a place called the Station Nightclub. Pyrotechnics were part of the band's act, but they had barely begun their set when stage props went up in flames. Fire alarms went off and over 400 people rushed towards the front exit. And uh, it was just like a stampede of people. So. Everybody just tried to get out, and they were jumping out the windows and, and out the front door. There were people on fire, and I've got a few friends that we still haven't accounted for yet. Um, it's just a lot of chaos, really. People were hurt and killed. In the rush to flee, the concert goers had panicked, and the narrow hallway that led to the exit became a death trap. The station nightclub burned to the ground in the space of six minutes. 100 people died and 230 were injured, with only 132 making it out unscathed. And it went up so quick, I've never seen anything like it. I, I'm, I just hope to God nobody got I mean, I know people got hurt, I just hope nobody got killed because this is too much to you know? There were no sprinklers. He's the only person who has taken any responsibility in this case. If this isn't the case that deserves a serious sentence of misdemeanor manslaughter, what one is? Following the fire, both the club owner and the band manager, 29-year-old Daniel Bichelle, seen here in court, were charged with 100 counts of criminal negligence and manslaughter. <laughs> 
This court will therefore sentence you to 15 years at the ACI, four years of which to be served by you, with 11 years suspended. This singular tragedy did much to influence fire safety codes in the United States. The club had no sprinkler system, something which could have saved many lives. This was scarcely the first or last time when a little prevention would have been better than any cure or rescue effort. What exactly is fire? Well, fire is most usually the visible result of a chemical reaction between oxygen and fuel of some kind. Gasoline or wood are two examples. Now, wood and gasoline don't just catch fire all by themselves, simply because they happen to be surrounded by oxygen in the atmosphere. For fire to occur, the fuel has to be heated until it reaches its ignition temperature. But whatever it is, be it lightning striking a tree or a match lighting the end of a cigar, if sufficient heat is applied to a flammable surface, then combustion occurs. And there you have it, fire. Of course, fire has many uses. But when it gets out of control, the consequences can be dreadful. Some of the most common causes of household and workplace fires are arson, but there are many other causes, like children literally playing with fire, electrical or lighting equipment that is faulty or misused, fireworks celebrations that go terribly wrong, candles burning down and setting furniture and fabrics ablaze, household appliances that malfunction, such as air conditioning units and washing machines, and commonly, cigarettes left smoldering in ashtrays. Much of the equipment we think of as standard for fighting fires was invented long ago. For example, the fire hose, made of flexible leather and coupled every 50 feet with brass fittings, first appeared in the 17th century. Yet it remains the standard even to this day in mainland Europe. The one thing that has never changed, of course, is the sense of duty, of valor. However sophisticated the equipment becomes, a firefighter is still expected to go rushing into a burning building as everyone else goes rushing out. Firefighters, whether male or female, and the vast majority are still men, are all required to pull heavy lengths of hose, to scale stairs while carrying giant power tools, and lift 35-foot long wooden ladders. All firefighters around the globe would agree on the importance of safety regulations in building codes and in the workplace, as well as fire safety awareness amongst the general public. The job of a firefighter is already tough enough, without carelessness and ignorance making it even more difficult. At least a thousand shoppers were inside the store when the fire began to rampage through the third floor. The store had been holding an American week. One theory is that the fire was started by anti-American demonstrators protesting against American policy in Vietnam. Even after all these years, over 300 people incinerated at once around lunchtime on a shopping day still seems an absolutely shocking loss of life. To this day, it is not clear where the fire began. In the furniture department on the fourth floor, the first floor children's wear department, or with exploding butane canisters in the third floor camping department, witness accounts vary. In any case, because no fire alarms went off, and nor were there any sprinklers, the alarm was slow to be raised. 
With just a small number of handheld fire extinguishers available, and the difficulty for firefighters of tackling an inferno in the midst of a maze of crowded streets, the fire spread quickly. How, or rather who, started the fire is still a matter of conjecture. A so-called American Week at the department store had instigated anti-Vietnam war protests, peaceful ones, it should be noted. But then a survivor claimed to have heard someone shout, I'm giving my life for Vietnam, just as the fire broke out. If anyone really knows the truth, they've kept it quiet for a long time. Restored, refurbished, and brimming with opportunities for retail therapy for today's Brussels Boulevard here, the tragedy that took place here now seems a distant memory. As we saw earlier in the case of the station nightclub blaze, playing with pyrotechnics is one thing. Making mistakes with weapons-grade explosives, that's the next level. But that's exactly what happened in Lagos, Nigeria, on a fateful day in January 2002. The accidental detonation of a large stock of high explosives at a military storage facility in Nigeria's second city had terrible consequences for the civilian population. Fires created by the debris scattered from this explosion tore through a large section of northern Lagos, creating a wave of panic that spread fast. As people fled, many stumbled into a concealed canal and were drowned. I give you up. Francis, boy, oh. Heard about the bomb from this barrack here. So, the first thing that we just saw, you had the sand. Bah! People were just rushing to the place, not until a big guy explosion. You just suddenly, your phone, boom, and everybody just started running. Our family are nowhere to be found. We don't have house to lay our head. We don't have food to eat. And then a very useless. The explosion and its consequences are believed to have killed at least 1,100 people, with many thousands more either injured or left homeless. They died an untimely death, innocently, and they deserve to be buried decently. I can see the most of my, one of my names of life is in ruins. I don't even know where to start from. I mean, you have to go in there to see the extent of destruction. There's nothing that can be taken out of this place. It's so terrible, my dear brother. The Nigerian government held an official inquiry, which blamed the army for neither maintaining the base properly or in fact decommissioning it as directed to do the previous year. History and tragedy almost repeated themselves in Lagos a dozen years later when there was a fire at the main police armory in July 2014. Fortunately, there were no casualties this time. On the 12th of August, 2015, the entire world was shocked by the news and dramatic footage coming out of Chanjin in northern China.
That's when two enormous explosions in the northern port city killed dozens of people, injured hundreds more, and laid waste to large parts of the city, igniting fires that would take firefighters several days to subdue. Like a nuclear explosion was a phrase that would be repeated again and again, both by news agencies and from eyewitness accounts. Satellite photos released by the Japan Meteorological Agency revealed that the explosions were so large they were visible from space. The two massive blasts occurred in the warehouse district of Tianjin. One of the blasts was said to be the equivalent of 21 tons of TNT. We Official Chinese media sources claim that the initial blasts took place at a petrol station in the so-named Binhai New Development Zone. There were also claims that the explosions took place at the port city's cargo terminal. For police and firefighters, the initial response was on search and rescue operations, more than putting out the fire to allow all the chemicals to burn themselves out. This being the age of social media, many people captured jaw-dropping photos and videos of the blaze. As firefighters did their best to battle the smaller fires that broke out around the site, toxic smells were discernible in the air. Chinese authorities were quick to reassure nervous citizens that the air had not been contaminated by the blasts and fires. But there was concern, to put it mildly, that some residences were situated too close to the industrial plant. According to Chinese work safety regulations, chemical warehouses containing potentially hazardous materials are meant to be at least 1,000 meters away from public buildings, roads, and so on. The chemistry explosion ruined the whole area around one kilometer. It was eventually confirmed that there had been several hundred tons of the toxic chemical sodium cyanide on the site at the time of the blasts, but the authorities insisted safety regulations had been strictly adhered to. In any case, it took nearly a week before the raging infernos caused by the explosions were under control. By this time, official figures put the death toll at at least 114 people, with dozens still missing. This grim statistic included 64 firefighters and six policemen, the usual frontline casualties in any battle against a disaster of this kind. Unlike earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes, fires are something that is within our capacity to prevent, at least for much of the time. 
There's also wisdom in the old Boy Scout motto, be prepared. For you never know when desperate hours may be ahead. Floods, fires, earthquakes, tornadoes, natural disasters. When these kinds of phenomena occur, they bring with them loss of human life, often on a massive scale. Tragic environmental devastation, plus destruction and hardship to spare. Arguably though, when it comes to man-made disasters, we have a different responsibility. Our focus for this chilling but fascinating episode of Desperate Hours is on nuclear and industrial disasters. Nuclear power depends on harnessing the energy released during one of two processes, nuclear fission or nuclear fusion. In both nuclear fusion and nuclear fission, energy is released from the high-powered atomic bonds between the particles within a nucleus. The nuclear energy produced can then be used to generate electricity. Ironically, nuclear power is a relatively clean source of energy, which is great. But of course, unless the utmost precautions are taken in generating nuclear power, then the consequences can go beyond merely disastrous to the unthinkable, the horrific. Fukushima, Japan, March 11, 2011. It was then that a terrible earthquake, followed by a tsunami, triggered a fault at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant to create one of the worst nuclear disasters of our times. First, a series of seven tsunamis, some as high as 15 meters, saw to it that diesel generators at Fukushima Daiichi were shut down. Flood water swamped the generators, causing them to fail. The reactors began to heat up.
Even after a plant shuts down, nuclear fuel requires continued cooling, which would usually have come from water being continually pumped into the reactors. With the earthquake knocking out electricity at the plant, emergency diesel generators were deployed to cool reactor units one, two, and three. But only an hour later, flooding from the tsunami knocked out the backup generators. Its immediate impact was felt by tens of thousands of people with homes near the plant. With the plant's critical cooling systems knocked out, it set off a chain of hydrogen explosions in reactors one, two, and three, and damaged the containment structure in reactor four. Particles from the melted fuel sent radiation levels dangerously high, to put it mildly. According to the Japanese Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency, the amount of radioactive cesium that spilled into the atmosphere was equivalent to 168 Hiroshima bombs. It must be said, the efforts of workers at the plant to contain the disaster were nothing short of heroic. In the aftermath of the tragedy, foreign media looking for a silver lining dubbed these workers as the Fukushima 50. なるべく戦力を下げなければいけないということだと思いますけど、ちょっとその技術的な問題もあるという話だったんで、そこのところはよくあの話を聞いてですね、なるべく効率的にそして戦力も多く下げれるようにということを考えていきたいと思っています。And in 2013, the Tokyo Electric Power Company admitted that some 300 tons of radioactive water per day was still leaking from the Daiichi nuclear power plant. Nuclear power has been with us now for 70 years. It was developed during wartime. World War II, to be precise. With the war dragging on in Europe and Asia, there was an arms race going on, the likes of which we have never seen before. The Germans had the edge on atomic power until the early 40s when a nuclear development program called the Manhattan Project got underway in the US. Top secret, but backed to the hilt by the government, the Manhattan Project's goal was the development of the atom bomb. Most of the critical research and development took place at a purpose-built facility in the new infamous Los Alamos, New Mexico. Five, four, three, two, one, five. At 5.30 a.m. on the 16th of July, 1945, the Los Alamos scientists successfully exploded the first atomic bomb. Robert Oppenheimer, Enrico Fermi, and their team had unleashed the staggering power of atomic reaction in a way their predecessors could only theorize about. Less than a month later, on August 6th and 9th, 1945, the first atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They remain the only two such bombs ever used in warfare. Nuclear testing, however, went on for decades, such as the 1950s, when this footage was taken over the Pacific of an atom bomb detonated at Enwateka Atoll. With the end of the war, scientists also began exploring the peaceful applications of nuclear energy. 
Though strict security guards the Atomic Energy Commission's laboratories in America, newsreel cameras are permitted to report on how the deadly radioactivity of atomic power is being put to work, not for destruction, but for the benefit of mankind. The first ever nuclear reactor to produce electricity started up in 1951 in Idaho. The experimental breeder reactor was admittedly very small, but within a few years, the first commercial nuclear plants had begun supplying electricity to the US, Russia, Japan, the United Kingdom and others. But major accidents in 1979 at the Three Mile Island power plant in Pennsylvania and in Chernobyl, Ukraine, seemed to cast the shadow of doubt over the future of nuclear power. The very name Chernobyl has become a byword for disaster. Not surprising especially when you take into account that 10 times more radiation was actually released at Chernobyl than in Fukushima. It happened during a routine reactor systems test on April 26, 1986. A sudden and obvious unexpected surge of power destroyed Unit 4 of the Soviet-era nuclear power plant. In the destruction and the fire which ensued, enormous amounts of radioactive material were released into the environment. Just as at Fukushima, there were desperate concerted efforts to contain the situation. Helicopters flew over the burning reactor, pouring sand and boron from above. This was meant to douse the fire, halt any additional emissions of radioactive material and thwart further nuclear reactions. They also cut down and buried around a square mile of pine forest in the surrounding area to reduce contamination in the vicinity. And tens of thousands of people were evacuated from the region. Within six months of the tragedy, and at great personal risk to the workers involved, a makeshift concrete cover was built over Reactor 4. The purpose of the so-called Chernobyl sarcophagus was of course to protect the environment, which was hoped it would do for decades to come. At an emergency meeting of the International Atomic Energy, Soviet officials presented their initial accident report. They estimated that radioactivity from Chernobyl would cause over 25,000 deaths over the following 70 years. A book, Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment, wrote by three eminent scientists, however, put the death toll at approximately 985,000. Directly after the meltdown, Soviet authorities sealed off the power plant within a 30-kilometer radius. Hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated, some directly after the incident, many more in following months and years. The new sarcophagus will be the largest movable man-made structure ever built on land. With radiation immediately above the reactor still much too intense for this new enclosure to be built over the top of it, nearby land was cleared and decontaminated. New безопасный confinement должны построить в 15 году. Поэтому всех в 15 году приглашаю сюда на площадку, чтобы посмотреть, как уже арка будет буду построена. However, these kinds of massive engineering works often encounter bumps in the road. The revised date for its completion is now November 2017. The IAEA doesn't actually keep a complete database of all the nuclear accidents to date. In 2011, however, 
The Guardian newspaper compiled a list of 33 serious incidents at nuclear power plants dating back to 1952. But nuclear power doesn't need to be involved for an industrial accident to have tragic consequences on an epic scale. A natural disaster, such as a volcano or earthquake, is something we have little to no control over. Safety in the workplace and care for the environment are a different story. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill, known also as the BP oil spill, began on the 20th of April 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. The Macondo Prospect was a BP-owned oil rig situated some 66 kilometers from the Louisiana coastline. On the evening of April 20th, a surge of natural gas blasted through a concrete core intended to seal the oil well for later use. The gas ignited on the oil rig's platform, killing 11 workers and injuring 17. On the morning of the 22nd, the entire rig capsized and sank. As it did, the so-called riser was ruptured. This critical piece of hardware is the pipe which connects an oil rig to an offshore oil well. With that, oil began to discharge into the Gulf of Mexico at an alarming rate. And indeed, this was to become the largest marine oil spill of all time. BP executives initially claimed the volume of oil escaping the damaged well was around 1,000 barrels per day. But US government officials claimed that the leak was more like 60,000 barrels of oil per day. Under intense but quite justifiable pressure from the US government, the local population, as well as environmentalists, and indeed the watching world, BP tried to seal the leak in various ways. First, the supposedly infallible blowout preventer malfunctioned. A containment dome in May didn't work either. A method called top kill, in which mud is drilled and pumped into the well, also failed to stem the flow. Eventually, a method called bottom kill was deployed, which involved pumping cement into the leaking well via two relief wells I don't understand why it took 87 days. It affects the, our whole economy and our ecology. Well, it's about time. We should have had a backup plan from day one. In the five months since it began, it was estimated that 4.9 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf, with only 80,000 of those captured. It is hardly surprising then to say that the leak's environmental impact was catastrophic. Incalculable numbers of fish and thousands upon thousands of birds, mammals and sea turtles were plastered with oil. Heartbreaking pictures of these bedraggled and ailing animals flashed around the world. In 2014, a New Orleans district judge ruled that BP's gross negligence was chiefly responsible for the disaster, calling their conduct reckless. Of course, in an industrial accident, no amount of financial compensation will bring dead workers back to life or safeguard the environment from long-term consequences. Now, a house of cards. It might be a popular TV series, but you certainly wouldn't want to work in a real one. But in April 2013, in Bangladesh, thousands of factory workers found out that's exactly where they were toiling. Thank you. 
আমি বাঁচতে চাই ভাই আমি বাঁচতে চাই খুব কষ্ট হচ্ছে ভাই খুব কষ্ট হচ্ছে আমার লির হরির দুটো বাচ্চা আছে ভাই ছোট ছোট ভাই The Rana Plaza in Savar, an industrial eyesore on the outskirts of the capital of Dakar, is where workers toiled away making Western designer clothing for as little as $40 a month. It sounds miserable enough, but the sweatshop conditions turned into a hell on earth when the building seemed to implode from within. Survivor accounts were similar to those of earthquake survivors. There was a loud cracking noise. The concrete floor under their feet began to shift, and then concrete pillars and beams collapsed under their own weight. Worse still, some workers had already expressed concern about cracks appearing in the walls of the building. Some of the offices and a bank had the sense to move their people out of there. But the factory workers were told if they wanted to hold on to their jobs, they would have to keep going to the factory. The search for the dead ended a month later with a death toll of 1,129. Over 2,500 people were pulled out alive from the wreckage. The collapse has gone on record as one of the deadliest disasters in the history of the garment industry. But the factory collapse came only a few months after a factory fire in Bangladesh killed 112 workers, all of them making shorts and sweaters for Western consumers. Disasters like the Savar Plaza building collapse only serve to illuminate the true cost of the high street bargain bin. Over 30 years after it occurred, the Bhopal gas disaster is still considered the worst industrial accident of all time. It was the result of negligence and incompetence on the part of a pesticide manufacturing company and government officials. It was in the early hours of the morning on December 3rd, 1984, that wind carried a grey cloud of poisonous gas from the Union Carbide plant in Bhopal, India. Some 40 tonnes of the toxic gas, methysocyanate or MIC, had been accidentally released from the plant, and it spread through the city, poisoning everything it touched. When I was in my MIC, I transferred to my MIC. So I said, this is advanced technology. We were watching it. Here is the same thing. The vital instruments that we know about the temperature indicator of contamination and temperature indicator, they didn't do it. We have reported that this is a false signal. There is a 5 degree temperature, and this is telling us 20. Well, no, it's faulty, it's not that you don't care about that instrument. It's a very vital instrument. So, you can also see the MIC plant in this way. So, there were some problems here, so the union came through, we had protested. To this day, there is disagreement about where and how the leak was sprung. Local activists and government officials contend that routine pipe maintenance created a backflow of water which spilled into a tank of MIC. But Union Carbide Corporation contends water entered the tank after an act of sabotage. Whoever was ultimately responsible, the result was a nightmare without end. Over 10,000 people were estimated to have died outright. As residents woke up to clouds of the suffocating gas, they began running through the darkened streets to local hospitals. By the time they got there, out of breath and often blinded as well, the damage was already done. The muscles, brains, lungs and eyes the gastrointestinal, neurological, reproductive and immune systems of the survivors were affected. Uh, 
On the morning following the leak, the Bhopal streets near the gas plant were like a scene from a horror film, with the difference that the carnage and devastation was all too real. In many ways, uh, people are worse than they were on the morning of the disaster. There are at least 150,000 people with chronic illnesses as a result of their exposure to the toxic gases. And uh, now we know that the next generation is also marked by union carbide's poisons. To this day, December 3rd remains a day of mourning in the Bhopal province, and the environmental impact will take many, many years to be forgotten. So there you have it. There are disasters and there are tragedies. And in this installment of Desperate Hours, we have seen both. As we have touched on before, the effects of natural disasters can be heartbreaking, catastrophic, the source of so much human suffering. But it's the incompetence and greed, negligence and arrogance of man that makes these nuclear and industrial accidents so especially tragic. In the wake of such tragedy, there is always a recrimination and pursuit of retribution. But often what has been lost can never really be recovered. And if that hasn't made you think twice about safety in your own workplace, we don't know what would. natural disasters and man-made catastrophes. Events that can cause enormous loss of life, destruction and hardship. In desperate hours, you'll become an eyewitness to some of the most noteworthy disasters of the last 100 years. This episode is bound to hit viewers where they live, which is really where we all live, inside our own bodies. Earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, volcanoes, and all the cataclysms that threaten human life. All of them are terrifying in their own way. But perhaps nothing is more chilling than the threat of disease, of epidemics. No other disaster feels more personal than something that literally gets under the skin. And in recent times, the threat of not merely an epidemic, but a pandemic which could annihilate mankind has somehow never seemed more real. But before we hit the panic button, let's brace ourselves by calmly and coolly examining the facts.
Ebola. Humans and some primates are vulnerable to this disease, which is a particularly unpleasant one. Between a couple of days and three weeks after contracting the virus, its symptoms become all too clear, starting with fever, a sore throat, headaches, and muscle pains. But that's just a preview to the horror show that comes next. Vomiting, diarrhea, and skin rashes, malfunctioning liver and kidneys, internal and external bleeding, including, in some cases, blood leaking from the eyes. It gets worse still. Around 50% of recorded infections have resulted in death around a week to two and a half weeks after the symptoms of Ebola first appear. Ebola, Ebola, even just from the sound of the name Ebola, it's frightening, you know, it's scary. And these people eventually uh, end up dying. And some of them have had actually minor bleedings from the mouth, their mouth. People will think it's not a big deal, and then it will get out of hand again and continue to spread for weeks and months and years. And that's what we have to stop. By the time people are dead with the Ebola, they are more infectious than all. So if they take care of their burial or their own, 10 more will be infected. We might tend to think of Ebola as a recent development, but actually it was first identified in 1976 in a village near the Ebola River. The scientist who named the disease Ebola, one Peter Pyatt, is now director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Although he first identified the virus in a village named Yambuku, he decided to spare the little town the stigma. Thus, Ebola got its name. Since its detection, the disease has flared up several times. Between 1976 and 2013, the World Health Organization reported a total of 24 outbreaks, including 1,716 fatalities. Bad enough, you might think, but in 2014, things took a turn for the worse. In March of that year, the World Health Organization reported a major outbreak in the West African nation of Guinea. The disease quickly spread to Liberia and Sierra Leone, Guinea's closest neighbors. On August 8, 2014, the World Health Organization declared the epidemic an international public health emergency. Medicine Sans Frontieres, Doctors Without Borders, described the situation in Liberia as catastrophic and deteriorating daily. Such was the fear and panic caused by Ebola. It actually kept people away from hospitals, leaving some patients with other conditions without proper treatment. Well, the outbreak isn't contained, so collectively we're not doing enough yet, uh, which is not surprising since this is the first outbreak in West Africa, so the governments are not experienced in responding to this. Their health facilities are completely overwhelmed. Uh, poor countries, they weren't all that brilliant to start with. I'm not criticizing them, they're just not. Panic and fear can be much more harmful than the disease itself. Maybe there will only be one case, but the harm that is produced by, by the fear uh, on the economy, on, on, on people, may be bigger. Still, in August of 2014, the disease spread to Nigeria, and one case was reported in Senegal. And on the 30th of September, the first confirmed case of Ebola in the United States ended eight days later with the patient's death. On 29 December 2014, the first case was confirmed in the United Kingdom. The high level isolation ward at the Royal Free Hospital in North London has been on staff. Even after 30 years, there is still much that is unknown about the disease. For example, although it is known that it is spread by direct contact with the blood or bodily fluid of an infected human or animal, there is still some doubt as to whether fruit bats are a regular carrier, apparently able to spread the virus without themselves being made sick by it. But advances are being made all the time, and diseases can be eradicated. After all, it's happened before.
Celtic smallpox, which historians believe was with humankind since the first agricultural settlements about 10,000 BC. Mummified remains of Egyptian pharaohs contain the first definitive evidence of smallpox in the ancient world. Though the first written accounts of the disease didn't appear until the 4th century AD in China. It rampaged through Europe in the Middle Ages and later in the 18th century was said to be responsible for the deaths of five reigning monarchs. Characterized by blisters on the face, arms, and legs, the last case of smallpox in the US was back in 1949, and one other case was in Somalia in 1977. The WHO certified that smallpox had been eradicated in 1979. This was just five years after one of the most serious outbreaks of the 20th century. It happened in India between January and May 1974, where an estimated 15,000 people died, mainly in the states of Bihar, Orissa, and West Bengal. Of the survivors, thousands were left disfigured or blinded. Yet, as we said, by 1980, smallpox was certified as being eliminated by the World Health Organization following their global smallpox eradication program. The Somalia smallpox eradication program recorded the last case in America town, and uh, it seemed to me that uh, this was the last known case of smallpox in the world. This was a big change for people in India and parts of Africa, where smallpox had long been considered a routine fact of life. However, it does seem at times as if the ingenuity of scientists and doctors is in a constant arms race against diseases that can mutate and take on a new form. Case in point, cholera. In straightforward terms, cholera is an acute intestinal infection caused by eating or drinking contaminated food or water. The time between infection and the first symptoms is sometimes less than one day five days at the most. The symptoms are diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and unsurprisingly, severe dehydration. Without proper treatment, death can come on fast. Prevention is better than cure, but when treatment is really the only option, then the faster, the better. Number one is rehydration. That's the replacement of lost body fluids using ORS, oral rehydration salts, namely salt and sugar mixed in with clean drinking water. Intravenous fluids and antibiotics all have their part to play in a cure. These are hardly luxury items, but when cholera strikes in a developing nation, they can be scarce commodities. Once the, the bacteria does get into the water supply or gets into the food chain, um, it's, it's very hard to contain without those basics, without the rehydration fluid and without clean water. We know that, uh, that over the last 12 months we've seen reported cases of about 19,000 uh, outbreaks of uh, cholera. We also know that over 1,000 people have, have died as a result of that. The first recorded cholera pandemic ravaged the Bengal region of India beginning around 1816 and lasted some seven years. Highly contagious, cholera spread to Southeast Asia, China, Japan, the Middle East, Southern Russia, and around the world. Pandemic cholera outbreaks wreaked havoc throughout the 19th century. Ironically, the spread of cholera was helped by advances in technology, transport, and the mass movements of migration. However, it wasn't until 1854 before an Englishman named John Snow identified its primary cause as contaminated water. But from 1992 onwards, 
the so-called El Tor strain has been the dominant strain in all new cholera outbreaks. Testimony to the disease's ability to mutate and adapt. Since 2010, El Tor cholera outbreaks have occurred in places such as Haiti, South Sudan, Mexico, Pakistan, and Sierra Leone. In a world that has become as connected as the one we live in, how can mankind ever hope to stop the spread of disease? This is Heathrow Airport. On average, about 200,000 people arrive and depart from here every day. If just a handful of them are carrying a highly infectious disease, the potential consequences are, well, sobering to say the least. That's just a geopolitical reality. But what can you do to personally stay safe? Because as we all know, prevention is better than cure. The Mayo Clinic in the US recommends washing your hands regularly, staying at home if you do fall ill, getting vaccinated where appropriate, practicing safe sex and other common sense measures, like preparing your food hygienically, As for the proverbial big picture, as you can imagine, scientific researchers are always looking for new ways to stop illnesses from upgrading to epidemics. And never has this been more critical. As the publication Science Alert reported in December 2008, climate change, along with increasing populations, overuse of antibiotics, and global trade and travel can affect both the likelihood of a new disease emerging and the opportunity for diseases to spread to new populations. Dr. Julie Lynn Hall, who is a communicable diseases expert with the World Health Organization, has made the point that we are seeing the return of diseases like cholera and malaria, previously thought eradicated. But also, for the last three decades, the WHO has seen the emergence, on average, of one new communicable disease per year. And apparently, the incidence of new syndromes is on the rise. This is a global concern. So where do we look for answers to understand how diseases spread and how to contain them? The study of societal networks can help us understand how diseases can spread. The fact that diseases pass from one individual to another via certain types of contact, and that any given individual only has a limited number of contacts, is the starting point for this kind of statistical analysis. That may sound a little abstract, but success in containing the spread of potential pandemics like SARS and avian bird flu suggests these studies are time well spent. Humanity still battles with maladies that have literally plagued us for centuries. New and deadly diseases have made themselves known in the new millennium. Notably, SARS and bird or avian flu. Beginning with SARS, short for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. The disease was first reported in the Guangdong province of China. It is believed it was transferred to human beings from Chinese horseshoe bats and from a feline-looking mammal known as a civet, considered something of a delicacy in that region. Generally speaking, SARS begins with a high fever, 
temperatures higher than 38 degrees Celsius. Other symptoms include headaches, general discomfort, and bodily aches and pains. Mild respiratory symptoms at the outset, a dry cough, and in some cases, diarrhea, are all indicative. Most patients also develop pneumonia. However, no two cases of SARS are precisely the same. The disease can run rather different courses depending on a patient's age and level of fitness. A critical point seems to be around the third week, when the young and strong often start to improve. For the less fortunate, this is when the disease becomes more severe, when the lungs become clogged with fluid and debris, and more aggressive treatment is applied, such as mechanical ventilation. This is certainly not effective in all cases. Worldwide, the death rate from SARS seems to be about 10%. In 2003, the illness spread to more than two dozen countries before it was contained. It's remarkable that the disease was effectively contained when you consider how easily it is spread, specifically by person-to-person -person contact when someone infected coughs or sneezes. The situation we are facing now is an extremely serious situation. Never before in the whole world, the healthcare system has been put under such immense stress. Now over 200 nurses and doctors fell ill to this illness. According to the WHO, some 8,098 people worldwide contracted SARS during the 2003 outbreak. Of these, 774 died from the disease. Tragic for all those people and their families, but things could have been worse, a lot worse. Once again, the WHO worked with governments of many nations and stemmed what could have been a global catastrophe. Avian influenza, known more informally as avian flu or bird flu, is an infectious virus that spreads among birds, and in some cases, human beings. Now, of course, most diseases that affect birds are not harmful to human beings. But two strains in particular have emerged in recent years that can be fatal. Even though these viruses are not thought to be transferred from one human to another, thousands of people have been infected since the first outbreak was detected in 1997, resulting in hundreds of fatalities. It was in that year, in China, that a strain of bird flu known as H5N1 laid waste to geese on a Chinese farm. The disease was found to have infected humans during poultry outbreaks in Hong Kong in 1997. 18 people were infected, six of whom died. It was unclear how the disease was being passed from birds to humans. Just the same, a mass culling of all poultry in Hong Kong may have prevented a global epidemic. Uh, we have just started the uh, chicken slaughtering uh, operation in the Changsha Wan temporary poultry market. And we estimate that the number of birds to be slaughtered today will be in the range of some uh, 40,000 uh, birds. <laughs> For a time, it may have even looked as if H5N1 had been eradicated. But in December 2003, it was back. Reported first in South Korea, where it caused outbreaks in commercial poultry farms. In January 2004, severe respiratory illnesses in 11 children were reported in Hanoi, Vietnam, that was soon confirmed as H5N1 bird flu. 
By the end of the month, there had been more than 400 outbreaks in Vietnam. The disease was then detected on a Japanese poultry farm in Kyoto. By the end of January, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia and China reported outbreaks in poultry. And in Thailand, two more human cases were confirmed. No strain of avian influenza had ever infected as many countries all at once. Thailand and Vietnam recorded a total of 35 human cases, 24 of which ended in death. It soon became apparent that despite all the efforts to control the virus, it had become endemic, which is to say, permanently present in parts of Asia. Migratory birds and possibly the poultry trade have since spread the virus to over 40 countries. What's more, the virus is now genetically different to the one first detected in Hong Kong in 1997. The current strain, known as the Z strain, has been shown to be more pathogenic, capable of infecting an expanding range of animals, including pigs, as well as cats and dogs. So are we fighting a losing battle against a global killer? The longer the virus is circulating in animals, including chickens and ducks, the greater the risk of human cases, and consequently, the higher the risk of a pandemic virus. Well, in all scenarios, we take into account that up to 30% up to of the population might get sick over a 15-week period. Yes, it's a very difficult matter. Eradication will come in many years. It's a matter of many years. Ebola and cholera in Africa, SARS and bird flu, principally in Asia. All of them diseases with frightening potential to go global in a flash. Smallpox we seem to have defeated, but that's what was thought about cholera just a few years back. If we as a species are to endure, we have to be ever vigilant as individuals. Don't forget to wash your hands before you handle food, for example. But we must also be able to act collectively against the spread of disease. Because when the enemy are literally germs, it's well to remember epidemics don't recognize territorial borders.